Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's City Council meeting. We're certainly pleased to have everybody here tonight. It is Tuesday, November 20th, and we'll start tonight's City Council meeting by introducing you to your City Council. Council Members Aguilar. Here. Anderson, Jr. Here. Entman. Here. Erpenbach. Jameson. Here. Karski. Here. Rolfing. Here. Staggers. Present. Thank you, Council. Appreciate it. Uh, as we do with every City Council meeting, we lead our meeting with an invocation, uh, with a prayer. Tonight, we're very, very pleased to have Reverend Matt Haig of Grace Community Church, located on West 49th Street here in, in Sioux Falls. It's a small congregation of about 25 people, but uh, uh, Reverend Haig has been there for five years. Just because it's small doesn't mean that it's no less important for our community, and we're certainly glad that you're here. Uh, he's, he's really excited about this, as are we. So um, please, Reverend Haig, welcome. Uh, will you lead us in prayer, please? Thank you. And then after uh, Reverend Haig is done, if you'll remain standing for our Pledge of Allegiance. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you that uh, we can meet here today uh, and uh, um, that uh, we are in a free country that uh, you have given us uh, the opportunity to lead uh, in this city uh, and be uh, uh, directed by these uh, people. Um, please uh, be with them as they make uh, wise decisions. Uh, may you be glorified as well uh, in our daily lives. Heavenly Father, just uh, bless the city of Sioux Falls. Uh, may uh, we be a beacon to other people as a city of, of honesty, of integrity, uh, of, of goodwill. Uh, and uh, may we be uh, a light. And we praise you and thank you in your precious son's name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 It'll be 21 tomorrow now. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, ask, ask on Friday tomorrow for a few dollars. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, John. Nice to meet you. Before we go to uh, the consent agenda, I do want to recognize a, a couple of special guests here. We've got uh, PAC, Cub Scout PAC 260. They are back. Uh, they actually made the, the paper on Sunday. Uh, which was which was a big big deal, and they're back here again today, and so we're excited to to, to have them here, uh, as well as we've got uh, Boy Scout Troop 346 from St. Michael's School here as well. First, I'm going to have the uh, Cub Scout Pack 260 from Harvey Dunn. If you'll stand again, please. We want to recognize you. And then in full force from St. Michael's School, Boy Scout Troop 346. Yeah. Well, welcome. And uh, leaders of the troops, uh, thank you so much for being here as well. Uh, Councilor Aguilar. Mr. Mayor, I ask that we remove the Vaults Retail Liquor License Renewal and Mercado's Package Liquor License Renewal from the consent agenda. And I move that we approve the, um, a, the consent agenda with those changes. Second, Karski. Very good. Uh, yes, Councillor Staggers. Yeah, I've got a, a question as to why we're removing the Mikado. The reason I'm asking is because I know there's some people here that wanted to speak in regard to that. Uh, it will be moved to the regular oh, agenda. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Very good. Uh, roll call vote, please. Okay, Council Members Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Entman? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Thank you. That has passed 7 to 0. We now will move on to that uh, regular agenda. Council, any uh, recommendations or changes? Would anybody want to make a motion to, uh, to approve? Move to approve, Entman. Second, Second, Aguilar. Councilor Edmonds made a motion to approve. It was seconded by Councilor Jamison. Uh, if there is no further discussion, a roll call vote, please. Okay, Council Members Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. 
Entman? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rothing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Thank you. That is passed 7 to 0. Again, welcome. Uh, what a packed house for tonight's City Council meeting. Great job. I, I love it. Uh, we do want to offer you an opportunity to engage the council uh, if there is an, uh, something you want to talk about that's not on the regular agenda. Uh, please come forward now. Otherwise, we'd ask you to wait until that agenda item. Uh, also, just introduce yourself, and if you could leave your comments to five minutes or less, we'd appreciate it. Anybody? Well, great. Let's move on to tonight's regular agenda. We will start with item number number 11. All right. We will start with uh, this is a request for the renewal of a 2013 retail liquor license for 5050 Holdings, Inc., for Deuces 9 Casino, also known as the Vault, 2601 South Carolyn Avenue. Good evening, Jamie Palmer, Licensing Specialist. I'm here to answer any questions that you have. Councilor Hanneman. Jamie, um, there's been some discussions about uh, about this uh, this is dealing with the vault the liquor license and I believe there are a few people here we've had a number of complaints from uh, businesses in the surrounding area concerning the actions of the patrons of the vault uh, specifically I'd like to know from them uh, what type of security uh, procedures they do when they have their special events and also I'd like to know what kind of effort they make in policing the area after their event is over with dealing specifically with picking up trash uh, and a number of other things there. So if we could get some input from these folks, I believe. Okay, I believe there was supposed to be someone here from the vault. Um. Hi, I'm Casey Cawthorn, I'm the general manager of the vault. Okay, you gotta step up a little bit. Mr. Mayor. Step away. Come a little Comes closer. Around. No, come a little closer <laughs> to the microphones, there you go. Okay, that's better. Good. I do have a, a question. Um, on a number of occasions, you've had some special events there, some outdoor concerts as well as some indoor concerts. Specifically, can you talk to me a little bit or explain to us the business model you have? Are you open all the time? Is this just a special event thing? Uh, can you explain that first, please? Our regular business hours are Friday and Saturday from 9 p.m. till 2 a.m. And then we have special events ranging throughout the throughout the month, whether it's uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it depends on the event. But those are just special event days. A number of our, of our uh, surrounding businesses there, specifically we've had a number of complaints from hotels, and, and it isn't just now, we've had these ongoing. Uh, and I believe on a number of occasions, and we'll ask the police to come up a little bit later here, and, and uh, we've got a few questions for them. But can you tell us some of the efforts and uh, uh, a number of these folks have said that you have, they have come over and they've tried to talk to, you, to the owners or the management team, trying to get some help, some understanding here. Uh, can you ex talk to us a little bit about that, please? Sure. Definitely when I, when I came on to the management team, um, they, they voiced their opinions and we've increased our security team. We've added more guys. On our special events, we always increase our, our activities with the local law enforcement. Um, we hire the off-duty police security team. We also, you know, bring out other security teams that just specialize in that for our special events. And then my, my guys on regular nights, they take special attention to clean out the parking lots. They go over to Sturt events. I know they go over to Holiday Inn. I, che I try to check in with the hotels periodically um, to make sure, you know, things are being done. But they, they have been, been taking out and cleaning the, the local areas within the block. What kind of, uh, when you do have outdoor concerts, excuse me, Mr. Mayor, please, what, what kind of timeline do you put on this? It seems like we've had a number of complaints about loud noises after 11 o'clock at night. Um, all of our outdoor concerts, we've always ended before 10.45 to, it's much before 11. Our, our cutoff time is usually 10.45, so it gives the efficient 15 minutes to, you know, get the, get the people out of the parking lot. Um, we've always followed all of the, you know, the compliance law or rules with given and gotten the correct um, okay. licensing. Councilor Karski. Talk to me about your parking. Um, attendance at your events, what kind of parking you have available for them on and maybe off property? Sure. 
Um, just this summer we had an outdoor concert and I had security guys part or their 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 post was at all the hotels to warn everyone there's no parking here if you're going to the event. Um, people park down the road in our parking lot and then they'll park across the street at Sturt events when it's non business hours. Um, I've always tried to make special care that we have someone outside letting everyone know if you park across the street at any businesses that they will be told that I mean that's someone's specific job they do that at, on all of our business nights um, including special events and on you know very much larger special events we we up that with extra posts to make sure that there's someone watching what's going on in the you know the local or the touching neighboring parking lots. Jamie, I am aware that uh, you've received a number of letters. Uh, I've received a number of letters. I know the council has as well. Are there folks in the audience tonight that wanted to speak on behalf of opposing uh, this uh, this r renewal of, of the license? Yes, I believe there's a couple um, people here from Stay Bridge, Stay Bridge Suites, if you want them to come forward. If, if they wouldn't mind, we'd appreciate that. If you would just introduce yourself to the council, please, and to the people of Sioux Falls. Sure. My name is Travis Hengem. I'm the general manager for the Staybridge Suites at 2505 South Carolyn Avenue. I also represent the Holiday Inn Express at 2501 South Shirley Avenue. Travis, thank you. Lori Starr, she's the night auditor for uh, Staybridge Suites, specifically works a lot of the uh, 11 to 7 a.m. shifts uh, during uh, Thursday, Friday, or Friday, Saturday evenings at the Staybridge there. I'm going to let her speak to you first. Uh, just to uh, uh, bear witness to some of the problems that we've experienced uh, as a result of this uh, uh, kind of business, and then I'd like to address the council. Thank you. Lori? Thank you. Over the past 11 months at working the night audit, I have dealt with many issues and patrons from the vault. I've had patrons vomiting in the parking lot, hotel parking lot, the sidewalks, near cars. I've had to go out there with buckets of water to remove the vomit so my patrons and my guests do not have to step in it in the mornings. I have dealt with males urinating in the parking lot. When asked to please leave, they tell me, what, you ain't seen anybody urinating before? Um, urinating on guest tires. Um, I have had to deal with patrons fornicating on guest vehicles in our parking lot. I've had to videotaped fights between patrons um, of the vault. I've even been accosted by one of the patrons at the vault when I was videotaping a fight. They grabbed my arm and tried to remove the video camera out of my hands. Um, this is not, there's not a weekend go by that I do not have complaints from my guests. I have to move guests. I have to continuously apologize to them because of the noise. I've had to deal with the patrons after 2 a.m. running up and down the street, yelling and screaming and cussing at the top of their lungs. And then I have guests that complain because of all the yelling and the noise outside. The car speeding up and down the street after 11 or after midnight two o'clock, the horns honking, the stereos blaring, the people sitting yelling out their windows, their sunroofs, screaming, hollering, cussing. I've had to also deal with that. Um, I've had, when I tow vehicles, there's signs posted everywhere. When I do tow vehicles, then I have patrons from the vault that come over, call me names, get angry, get very, very nasty because their cars have been removed from our parking lot because I have guests that complain that they do not have any parking. And so um, I do carry a video camera with me every time I go out now. I also have the cops on speed dial, 911. They also check in with me on the weekends to make sure everything is okay because there's times that I do fear. There's drunks that come over. And like I said, once before I've had tried to, they've tried to take the video camera, actually grab my wrist to remove the video camera out of my hand. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Travis, did you want to speak uh, to the council? And Lori, don't go too far. Okay. 
Thank you. I'm here tonight to object to the renewal of the liquor license used by the Vault Nightclub at 2601 South Carolina Avenue and to give the council an idea of the problems that we and the other area businesses have experienced from this nightclub. Our position is simple. Uh, this establishment does not belong in this area. The reason is clear. This, with this type of business has come and will continue to come a large number of problems and disruptions to our business as well as the neighboring establishments. Some of the problems experienced are trespassing, loitering, littering, vandalism, fights, public drunkenness, public urination, public fornication, uh, noise, lost business, lost revenue and additional expense, reckless and drunken driving. At the Staybridge Suites, the Holiday Inn Express, our business is simple. We sell sleep. The very idea uh, behind going to sleep goes hand in hand with a sense of safety and security and quietness, all of which is under constant siege from the very nature of the business being sold at the vault. A self-description of the vault from the vault's website says, the vault offers a decadent atmosphere. Merriam-Webster's defines decadent as marked by decay or decline, of or relating to or having the characteristics of decadence, characterized by appealing, characterized by or appealing to self-indulgence. The vault nightclub sells decadence, a place where people can be loud, self-indulge, drink to excess, lower their inhibitions, and party. They have a venue for 640 people. Let me repeat that. They can pack 640 people into their establishment. They have parking for 86 cars. In one year's time, they've amassed 154 police calls to this location. Another 20 or so from the Staybridge and the Staybridge guests to police for problems relating directly to the vault. As a, as a result of the, of the vault's grossly inadequate parking and incompatibility with this business at this location, we have had to tow approximately 140 vault patrons and in some instances vault staff vehicles from our lots. By way of contrast, the Outback Steakhouse at 2411 South Carolina Avenue has a capacity of 220 uh, persons and 144 parking spaces and has a total of six, six police calls in a year's time. The Brazilian Carnival Grill at 2401 South Carolina Avenue has a capacity of 300 and 120 parking spaces and has had a total of four police calls in a year's time. Foley's Fish House, Chop and Steakhouse at 2507 South Shirley Avenue has a 300 capacity and 109 parks and has had a total of three police calls to their location, one of which was documented as a female arrested for underage consumption and ingesting after coming from the vault. Ruby Tuesdays at 2425 South Shirley Avenue has a 250 capacity and 100 plus parking spaces and has had a total of six police calls to that location. I'd like to read for you just a couple comments from some of our guests regarding the Staybridge Suites and the vault. The noise level was unbearable. There must be a bar nearby because there was constant noise late into the night. Great staff, good location. The noise from the nearby nightclub on a few nights was way too much. The staff was apologetic, but unable to change it. Clearly they had dealt with this in the past unsuccessfully. Manager was frustrated about it also. Good location off the interstate, close to things I needed to do while in Sioux Falls. On our second night, a Saturday, the music and the patrons at the bar located on the south of the hotel woke me from my sleep due to loud conversation and very loud music while we were in the south wing. One more here. While we were returning from my father-in-law's funeral, when I called, I stated this was the case. We were put in a room rather inconsiderately, given the very fragile state we were in, but in any situation, a terrible room, because the windows faced a bar called the vault. And all I could hear until 2 a.m. was booming bass. On top of the grief and the storm coming in, my head was ready to explode from the pounding noise from the nearby bar. 
We've spent this year $23,000 putting up an eight-foot vinyl privacy fence to try to mitigate some of the problems that we experience from uh, the result of the patrons that frequent this establishment uh, with little to no success. Just last, was it two weeks ago, Lori? You, were in a, you and a guest, was that two weeks ago? Witnessed. Yeah, yeah, just two weeks ago, Lori and a, and a guest of the hotel witnessed a patron come driving in to our parking lot, get out of the car, proceed to urinate on another car beside it, and head over to the vault. This is a, a letter from a, a former neighbor of the vault. It was a daycare that was located directly across the street from them. Uh, to whom it may concern, it has come to my attention that the vault's liquor license is up for renewal, and I would like to, I would like to state a few concerns I have in this matter. My business, Give Me a Break, was located across the street from the vault, and while there, I had several issues that continually came up. There was constant garbage from the bar in the form of cigarette butts, liquor bottles, and beer bottles in my parking lot. As my business had evening hours, the noise level was extremely loud and created hesitations from parents to leave their children during those hours. I will mention I was at this location successfully for several years until the vault opened. After the vault opened, my business dropped drastically and I was forced to move my location or close my business due to lack of customers. Thank you for your attention and consideration in this matter. Signed, Lori Johnson, Director of Give Me a Break Daycare. Travis, great job. I, I think that uh, the council certainly is, is understanding um, your concerns. Lori, can I, can I ask, are there, um, Lori, sorry, Jamie, are there other businesses as well that are here uh, in opposition of the, uh, the vaults uh, renewal? Don't, don't go too far away, Travis. I've not had anybody check in with me, but we could just certainly look. Is there anyone else in the audience who wanted to speak in opposition of the vault uh, having their, uh, their license renewed? Is there anyone in, in favor of uh, having the vault uh, license renewed uh, outside of uh, Katie? Yes. Sort of, if you wouldn't mind coming forward, I should have had you come forward earlier. My apologies. Uh, Travis and Lori, if you wouldn't mind just sitting down, and, and I'm sure there will be some questions later. Again, my apologies. I, I made a mistake here. Sure, welcome. Kirby Meilenberg. I'm actually one of the owners. Of Thanks, the Kirby. Club here in Sioux Falls. Uh, just want to relate to the council that over the last year and a half, two years, we have tried to work with the hotel next door. It is very unfortunate that in our business, we do sell alcohol, and unfortunately, people don't always make the best decisions while they're drinking. We have done everything that we can inside the establishment from hiring off-duty police officers every night we're open. We, you, it's hard to explain. Those officers, we are proactive on anybody. There's zero tolerance policy in there for any inappropriate behaviors. You would probably find that, I would guess, 75 to 80% of those other police calls were placed from us to remove patrons that were causing problems. Uh, you know, we just, we try to run the best show we can there. It's very difficult next door with the hotel. Travis does sell sleep. Unfortunately, our business, we sell the opposite of that. And it's, it is a tough mix. Um, but I would ask the city council to understand that we have a large investment in the liquor license and the establishment. And, and we'll continue to do whatever we can to make it right with the neighbors. I guess that's all I have to say. Kirby, thank you. Is there anyone else who wanted to speak on this on this topic before I um, turn it over to the council? I believe they have done everything they can. That's not my point. My point is it's the wrong location for this kind of business. I don't have anything against Mr. Muhlenberg and the, and the business itself. It just needs to be in a location that is better suited to the types of problems that come up with that. It's in direct conflict with the businesses in this area. Thank you, Travis. Thank you. Council, I'm not going to turn it over to you. Uh, Councilor Stangers. Yes, could I um, ask uh, some questions of Lori? Lori? Travis, would you mind coming forward to, uh, as well as uh, Katie, and we'll just have you, have you ready. Thank you. Well, it sounds like we're having a problem with enforcement of various ordinances and laws. So my question deals with two uh, issues. 
do you often see the vault security around trying to stop this and also the Sioux Falls police? Are they patrolling this area on a regular basis? Um, the vault, I don't see anybody from the vault. Even after two o'clock when I go out to pick up the trash that the patrons throw over the fence, um, that they leave behind in the street and in our yards, there's, I don't see anyone from the vault. Uh, the police do the best that they can. They are there patrolling. There's a couple officers that I've worked with that check in with me. Um, it just depends on the night because I understand too that they have other calls that they have to take too. So they do try. Councilor Sayers? Yeah, I guess I'm just kind of amazed because somewhere along the the road here, we're not having but somebody carrying out their, their function. Like the vault security, it would seem to me if they have off-duty police, they should know how to handle these individuals. Now maybe that's something we can ask of Kirby, what's going on there, but. Uh, I don't have any idea. I don't see, like I said, I don't see anybody out there. Um, I don't see anyone letting them know that their patrons shouldn't be parking in the parking areas. I don't see anyone picking up trash. I, to be honest with you, I don't see anyone from the vault. Okay. Unless the last time that I have seen someone physically from the vault was the night that I videotaped a fight. Okay. Councilor Sagers, did you want um, Kirby or is it Katie? K K yeah, yeah, Kirby, I'll go. Casey? Councilor Sagers, did you want Casey or? Uh, Kirby, Kirby. Think, Kirby, uh, would you mm -hmm. mind? Well, the hardest part about the, the bar industry is, is that the patrons inside are typically having fun. It's, it's what happens between the sidewalk and their car is where we're running into the problem. On our property, within the bar, it, everything is okay. But in between the sidewalk and their car, you know, we don't really police that. That's public property. You know, I mean, as a business owner, if you're in the mall, how far beyond your walls of your business are you responsible for? So that's the hard part. Mm -hmm. If we could have another 50 security people on staff lined up and down the street, then we'd be able to take care of that problem. But that's obviously not very feasible. So that's where the problem comes in, is in between. Well, Lori has just mentioned she doesn't even see the, the uh, vault and security people anywhere. There again, she's in her parking lot. So to staff her parking lot would be difficult for us as part of our business plan. Mm -hmm. How many, how many off-duty police do you normally have on? Friday or Saturday night, it'd be anywhere from seven to eight. And usually two of those are off-duty police officers. You said seven? Seven to eight security officers. Not security officers, but security staff, and at least two of those are off-duty. Yeah. Okay. I sounds to me like you should have an operation that's rather uh, sedate uh, and quiet uh, with all those security people. You know, it's like, like we've said, people obviously don't always make the best, best choices mm -hmm. um, when they're drinking. If I could just uh, make an another comment here. I mean, I, I agree with you. We have to have these people responsible for their own actions. But there is one area where you should probably be more responsible, and that's in regard to complying with the noise ordinance. Uh, what have you done to comply with the noise ordinance? I believe we've had a couple outdoor events at the vault and we've had the, the people from the city come and monitor the noise levels and everything has been perfect. The noise levels that you hear on a typical Friday or Saturday night are well within the limits of the noise ordinance. Obviously, you can still hear it, but it's, it is not a violation of the noise ordinance. Okay. And I believe, I don't know if there's anybody here to attest to that, but... No, that is correct. Councilor Anderson, Jr. Kirby, with your security plan, you said you had six, seven security personnel. A couple of them are police officers. Exactly how much of the property is that covering? Is it just covering the internal part of your building, or is it covering your parking lot? You, you know, know I, I, that's, that's what we're looking at. I think that's what we're struggling sure. with. <clears throat> Typically, it starts at the front door. Obviously, that's once they enter the parking lot or enter the business, you know, that's where it starts. Um, when it gets closer to closing time, we start to focus more on the outsides to try to get people to move on so there's not troubles in the parking lots. There again, you know, with, with the building size that it is and the parking that we have, there's a lot of on-street parking. So there are cars parked 
up to a half mile away. So that for us is difficult to police. And you know, we're not the only bar on that street. So, and you know, it kind of comes into some other things. You know, we do our best at picking up the garbage from all the parking lots. And I can tell you, I've done it myself many times. And I would say half of the garbage comes from probably more than half comes from other people other than our business but we clean that up because you know we're the bad neighbor right now so even if there's a Burger King wrapper in somebody else's parking lot we try to pick that up because you know we want to coexist with everybody and be good neighbors oh um, thank you mayor yes Councilor Anderson. Uh, do we have law enforcement here to give we us do. their numbers? And we do. I, I did have a letter submitted from a gentleman named Steve Burtis. He is a Sioux Falls Police Department officer. I don't know if, he, if Jamie was able to get that to everyone. Mm -hmm. He is responsible for scheduling our off-duty police officers for us on the weekends. So hopefully you got that. Thank you. Is there someone from the police team that uh, could respond to Councilor Anderson Jr.'s questions? Welcome. Would you just introduce yourself to the people of Sioux Falls, please? Yes. Lieutenant Matt Burns. I'm the Southwest Quadrant Commander. Thanks, Lieutenant Burns. Councilor Anderson, Jr., did you have some questions for uh, Lieutenant Burns? Yes. Could you give us maybe a brief description or explanation on police calls, the type of police calls that are happening out in that area that are related to the vault? Yes, as Mr. Hengem alluded to earlier, we have had 154 calls for service there from November 1st of last year to November 1st of this year. Those 154 calls are all related specifically to the address of the vault. Amongst those, there were 39 arrests made and 31 citations written for everything from driving while intoxicated to assaults, curfew of violations, disorderly conduct, um, intoxicated subjects, fight disturbances, liquor law violations. Those are chief among the violations that we see there. Uh, at the vault. Councilor Jameson. Thank you, and uh, Matt, as long as you're up here, I'll ask, I'll ask you a few questions if I could. You know, those numbers, 154 police calls, how does that compare, though, on an average year for them? I mean, how long have they been open? Do you have any numbers like this? How many, what's, what's the numbers been the last few years? Is it always 150? Yes, I did run the numbers from the same time frame the year before, and the vault had 90 nine zero calls during that time frame. Um, I would offer that I think a significant number of those 154 calls uh, do originate from the vault staff. Um, of course, we do have a few calls from people driving by, people inside the uh, parking lot calling on cell phones, but a good number of those calls um, are from our off-duty officers who are calling to get assistance with some sort of fight disturbance or any number of matters. Um, just for point of reference, also during the same time frame, um, we had 129 calls at Borrowed Bucks, 112 calls at Wiley's, and 108 calls at the 18th Amendment. So you can see that just generally, as you might expect, those kind of establishments do have a higher call volume um, due to the things that they sell and the, the clientele. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Councilor Inman. questions I had about from uh, Councillor Jamison. I was specifically interested in the number of calls that originated from the vault itself and from the staff there from your security, from the security officers. So you answered that. Thank you very much. Councillor Rolfing. Uh, yes, I have a question for uh, Mike Cooper, please. Thank you. <coughs> Mike, um, not to put you on the spot, but I guess I will. I've done it before and I you know, we've got, a, we've got a building there that's set up for 640 people. Is it common to only have parking for 86 cars for that big a building? The parking requirements that we enforce are based on the building size, and it's one, stall, one parking stall for every 100 square feet in this particular case. And the fire marshal allows? That I'm not aware of, and so that's something okay. that I would like to go back and look at. Okay. Is the building occupancy. So the building size allows only, only requires 86. The building size determines the number of required parking spaces. Okay. Then um, Keith, Keith or um, Kirby. Kirby, could I ask you a question? Mike, before you leave, just uh, okay. for Council Rolfing's, because uh, that's an important point. 
Is there anybody on the city team that can answer the occupancy yes. uh, question that Council Rolfing had? I, I don't see we had anybody here from fire. Because I, I think, Council Rolfing, your question is, uh, so we base the parking um, based on the square feet, which you answered correctly, Mike. Yep. But now the question is, okay, so how many people can you have in a building ba uh, regardless of the square feet? Right. Uh, in and I think there's a there's usually a, a plaque there or something that's posted. that's posted, mm -hmm. Very and good. that's what I'm going to ask Kirby. Is there Kirby? Could you not come forward, please? Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Does that does that adequately say you can have 640 people there? It does, and I think uh, the number that Travis quoted I don't believe is counting the parking spots on the end of the building. I think there might be closer to 100 parking spots there. there I is think. Some on the end of the building, but I will point out that uh, Kirby. As signage there protecting your parking at the casino that mm -hmm. says strictly there for the casino only so yes. when dealing with the issue of the vault we have 86 parking spaces okay so we have 86 parking places for 640 people what would what would happen if if the fire marshal came in there and said uh, you could only have 300 people there I guess based on that occupancy, it would be difficult to pay the rent. I mean, you know, the building is designed for that many people. We've added fire exits. We've added, you know, fire suppression system, everything to have that occupancy okay. level. Then, then Mike, when we, when we do that, the size of the building, are we looking at what the use of the building is, or are we just looking at the size of the building? Um, in other words, uh, you know. We're looking at both. We're looking at the, the use determines the calculation for the parking requirements. In this case, the use says you calculate that based on one space for every 100 square feet. 100 square feet. So they got building six. Area. They got over 6,000 square feet in that building. I'm not sure what the building square footage is. but That Kirby, was my, my can brain you that? quickly going. The vault is about 7,000 square feet. 7,000 square feet. OK. Councilor Jameson. Kirby, I think the, the real question is, are you counting those individuals? Are you keeping track of the occupants? Oh, yes. yes. You, and you keep a log? And we don't keep a log necessarily, but, you know, Elder. 640 people is a lot. And I can tell you there's been a handful of times that we've ever reached that many people in there. Okay, and then if I could follow through with some other questions. The... Uh, Here are all the letters we've received regarding your establishment. How can you justify occupying all the businesses around you with a nuisance? How can you do that? Other businesses that we have that are operating under the same restrictions, some of the establishments that they just mentioned, the 18th Amendment, borrowed box, we don't have a letter, a, a stack of letters just like this complaining about them. Why do we have them about yours? The only difference is, honestly, is because there's a hotel next door. What Travis said is, is true. People are trying to rest. If you, if you look across the street from here, I guarantee you, on any given, given weekend night, you might see a scuffle in the street or somebody maybe getting sick on the sidewalk. I mean, it's, it's an unfortunate side effect, you know, side of our business that nobody likes. I mean, if it was up to me, none of those things would ever happen. Obviously, we're there to have a great time, our customers to enjoy themselves, and go home safe and sound. We, the last thing we want to do is be a bad neighbor. And I think that any other establishment we're involved with, it's the same thing. It's just we have a different neighbor there. But what my question is to the city council is, we have the investment in the liquor license. We have the investment in the space. We've met all the criteria. We're not breaking any laws. We are operating our business within the statutes. Well, one of the, uh, one of the authorities that the council has is the ability to not renew your license. Absolutely. Based on the fact that it's not a suitable location. You're standing here in front of us telling us that it's not a suitable location. Right. Now, let's just hold on. The, there is some truth here that your building was there before those hotels and the hotels came and built around you. And perhaps they knew what they were getting into, but I'll bet they thought they were building a building next to 
what they probably experienced in the past, other bars that would operate under a different kind of a scheme. You've kind of seemed to have ballooned out of that and it's causing a major problem. So how do we figure this out? Who, uh, who stays and who goes? I think the hotel should move. Councilor Aguilar. I think that there are quite a few questions left to be answered, and I think one of them has to do with having uh, the fire marshal here to talk about the occupancy. So I would like to make a motion that we defer this until the December 4th um, meeting so that we can bring in those people that we need to bring in and also give the owners of the vault. They have an idea now of the kind of questions that the council has and maybe they'd like to come back with more information for us. And I'll second that. There has been a motion to defer this item to December 4th that has been seconded. Uh, uh, is there any uh, additional dialogue on this? No. no. Mayor? Yes, Councilor Jameson. Yes, just before we defer, we should at least uh, either have just a little more discussion about what the applicant should be doing on his on this on this deferral time to prepare himself for what is to come, and as well others uh, things that we might want done. The fire marshal, okay, fine. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's a uh, councilor Jameson. I think to if you don't mind, I think to your point, uh, even as you're as you're thinking through this, I think there's a number of questions that yeah. not only you have, but I think probably other councilors have as well. And it would give you an opportunity to put those questions together, uh, not only go to folks like uh, uh, the owners of the vault, but also the owners of the hotel, as well as the city team will gather that information together. Uh, so I think that that's probably one of the, ra the rationale for the, defer for the deferral. Um, yeah, like, Councilor Jameson, please. Yes, I understand that. I guess what I was alluding to was uh, preparing the, the owners of the vault and others of all the information that this council would want, not just the fire marshal, just so we don't wait for the December 4th to have the fire marshal come, no. only to, to have a lot more questions. So if there's other questions we want, other answers we want, let's do that, let's make that clear tonight, that's all. Uh, uh, Councilor Antman? I might suggest here that, uh, and I'd be more than happy to do that, I, I do think that there are questions that have come up, and I think all of us need to verbalize a little bit or think about them a little bit more, I know I do. I, I would suggest that, uh, that we get the uh, questions put together here by the end of the week, um, and that you submit them to leadership, either to Michelle or myself, and then we will pass them on to the parties that have given us the letters, as well as we will require the respective city teams from police to fire to be here to answer the questions that we might have. So I would suggest that we do that. Councilor Stangers. Councilor Stangers. Yeah, I think this is a golden opportunity for both parties to see if they can straighten things out between now and December 4th. In other words, can we have Kirby's operation operating more quiet, less incidents and things like that? And so if, if we could have the, the hotel, you know, document everything between now and December 4th and Kirby, we'll see, you know, how well you can. You have all those security people. I mean, it, it seems to me you should be able to get a handle on this whole process. There has been a motion to defer. I'd like to say one more thing. Councilor Rolfing. Um, I'm going to take Councilor Stagger's step, step further. I would encourage the two parties to get together and come to this group or to this council with a game plan in writing saying this is what we're going to do and this is what the consequence or this is what we expect to happen because of that and and sit down and say you know this is this is where it's and this is the reason why we're going to do that and and make some not necessarily some compromises but let's get the thing so that you can be can be good neighbors you know where we're where we're going and take some time and and make some make some give some give and take on the thing, and uh, see if you can work it out and come here with it. Okay. There has been a motion to defer. Uh, it was made by Councilor Aguilar, seconded by Councilor Rolfing. We've had very good discussion, uh, not only on the deferral but uh, on the t on the whole topic itself. And I think uh, you can sense there is a high level of seriousness on this particular topic. I would strongly encourage. Uh, 
the owners of the vault, the manager of the vault, to heed the comments made by this council. They're not messing around with you. Uh, with that in mind, uh, a roll call vote, please. Council members Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Entman? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. That has passed seven to zero. Uh, Jamie, I know you also wanted to talk about another establishment uh, named the Mercado. That's correct. Jamie? Uh, I know that there's an attorney um, with, as well as the owner present that would like to speak to that item. And I haven't had anybody else check in with me, but I understand there was um, someone here that would like to speak against it as well. But I don't know their Very good. Why don't we start it. with uh, the, the folks from the Mercado? Mike Hansen is the attorney. Jamie, we're going to read into the record uh, the address of the Mercado uh, before they speak. Uh, Lori, would you mind doing that, please? Sure. And this would be for the 2013 renewal of a package liquor license for Bile Z Abebe for Mercado at 631 West 11th Street. Sir, welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Hanson. I'm an attorney here in Sioux Falls. My office is about three blocks from uh, Bailey's business, the Mercado. He's been in business for eight years. If you look at the sheet, there's been absolutely no violations, no convictions, no nothing. And it's understanding that Councilwoman Aguilar is the one who took this off the consent agenda. It's our belief there are three other businesses in the square where he's at, and all three of them are in the liquor business. I see the manager of the half of the building that my client is not involved in, a different landlord. The building's actually kind of cut in two, where Mr. Um, Claussen is here with us. He actually is the owner of the part of the building that my client is in, and he rents to him whereas another entity rents then to would be the lucky lady. I believe there's a Mexican store in there that sells alcohol in a place called the Sudanese General Store. And it seems my client's being singled out here. We've had absolutely no violations. He's an upstanding citizen of the community here, and I'd ask that the license be um, renewed. I just don't see what the problem is. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. Sir, did you want to speak as well? Uh, if you could just introduce yourself, please. My name is Balai. Uh, I, I hope uh, most of you remember me when uh, the first day I came here to ask uh, for liquor license and you guys approved me. I remember Lori and you guys and here also. And uh, really to establish that business, I sacrificed. 15 hours a day without break, years and after years, and I didn't nothing about it. I didn't break any code. I didn't. I may continue a bit for my client. Um, he's been in business for eight years. I, in the past 23 years, probably have represented more people in magistrate court than anyone here in town. And I'm aware that my client is proactive. He calls the police and reports people who are loitering, begging in the police in the parking lot and files complaints. I've got the trespass, the paperwork that he has filled out asking that the police arrest people. I've got about five, six of them here for loitering. He doesn't tolerate it. He does what's being asked. He calls the police. And we've got him here and now for some reason some unknown person wants to put him out of business, which, quite frankly, I don't think is very fair. Mr. Hanson, I, I'm going to stop you right there. The, the council has the opportunity to review all liquor licenses that are up for renewal. If they want to complete some additional due diligence on any of these, whether it be the vault, whether it be the Mercado, whether it be any other um, uh, establishment that serves alcohol in this town, They've got the ability to do that. Uh, in, in this case, they wanted to ask some questions or do some additional due diligence on the Mercado before they make a decision on that. 
So before you start to accuse a counselor or someone else for doing something that is appropriate or not, I would encourage you to use caution. Well, I'm toning it down a bit, but... I would encourage you to tone it down a bit. We just Nothing's been brought forward to us, though, what the problem is. Well, sir, the council hasn't had the opportunity to ask the questions. Okay, fair enough. Baby, th thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who wanted to speak uh, in opposition of the Mercado? Yes, sir, or ma'am, if you would come forward, please. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, uh, yes. are there any other people that want to speak in favor oh, of Oh, thank you, yes. Councillor Staggers. Thank you. Very good point. Before we do that, uh, thank you, Councillor Staggers. Good job. Sir, come on forward, please. Thank you. My name is Nick Clausen. Thank you, and Nick. I, I own the building that the Mercado is in. Thank you, Nick. And we have uh, multiple other properties downtown. Uh, we want downtown to be cleaned up in a nice place uh, to live and work. Uh, I'd like my buildings to be uh, clean in a place that people want to go to. I don't see how uh, eliminating uh, Belize business will do that with the other establishments downtown that sell, really sell the same thing. Uh, if you close him down, those people will, you know, walk one block to the west or, you know, several steps to the east. Thank you. Nick, very good job. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wanted to speak on behalf of the Mercado? Very good. Ma'am, would you want to speak in opposition of the Mercado uh, receiving their license? Uh, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Ellison Murray Cotrer. I'm one of the partners in Murray Properties that owns 601 to 623 West 11th Street that includes eight businesses, two of which are vacant right now, and I'll get to that reason. Um, we also have 18 apartments above our strip mall that conclude of 31 residents and 16 of the 31 are children. We had, I have been making complaints for quite a while. Uh, this very short backstory to this problem is it's been an ongoing issue. Everybody knows the strip between 11th and Duluth and Summit and 11th has been an issue in the neighborhood. It's no mystery why it's a low-income neighborhood and there are three businesses right there that sell liquor you go two blocks down and there's munchies there's another one i'm not trying to put mr abibi out of business i'm trying to clean up my neighborhood we can't rent our apartments because of the solicitors the trespassers and the illegal acts that are going on in that business while I was in one of our vacant spaces one day waiting for a person to show up, kind of cleaning up that kind of stuff, I witnessed three prostitutes, two drug deals. Um, I also witnessed people coming from across Duluth on the east side, going to Mercados and then coming back um, across the street, back and forth. I was in the space for almost four hours just watching. My client or the prospective tenant never showed up. That's a common thing in that neighborhood because they drive by, they see the building, and they say, I don't want my business there. Um, we have done everything that we can as a business. We own about 75% of that building. We have put up security lighting. We have rented lights from Excel Energy and put them up in our parking lots. We have done, um, we had a meeting with the mayor and Councilwoman Erpenbach, and I believe Councilman um, Entman was there. We made a lot of promises to you, Mayor, and we fulfilled those promises. We've done everything that we said we were going to. All of our tenants clean up. They go into their businesses early. The neighborhood has gotten a little bit better because the police are constantly there. And um, after the meeting with the Mayor, we, I called Officer Jim Larson and set up a survey of the property to, to where he could tell us as from a police officer standpoint what we can do to make the neighborhood safer we did everything he's asked us to we have put locked gates on our stairwells coming up we have um, priced out caging this um, ladders that go up to our rooftops because we have a lot of drunks that go up there um, everything that we promised you mayor i discussed with the owners of that building and they have not returned a single phone call they have not returned a single email I went in that space with Officer Larson and spoke to Mr. Abidi. He acted like there was nothing wrong. I have people 
I'm on that property daily. I have personally witnessed the illegal acts that are going on. I have personally witnessed the prostitutes, the drug deals, the drunks. Um, Lieutenant Schmidt is here and he can testify, yeah, Mr. Beebe does make a lot of phone calls to the police, but what they're not telling you is that Mr. Beebe, a Beebe also has been known in the past to pay these transients in beer to stock his shelves for him. I'm grateful that his attorney ha doesn't have any problems three blocks down. I invite his attorney to move his office space into one of our vacant spaces and then he can have a front row seat as to the problems in that neighborhood. I don't wish Mr. Beebe to lose his business. I don't wish that on anybody. But we need to clean up that neighborhood and I can't do it on my own. Um, I have sent multiple emails back and forth between myself and Councilwoman Erpenbach, and I believe she's forwarded them to you all so you have an idea of everything that's going on. Since the meeting with you, Mayor, we've, people are still hanging out out front. They're still hanging out in, around the corners. The same day we did the survey, the Claussons brought up that they're putting up these huge immaculate signs in their laundromat. It's handwritten marker on their walls. There's no nothing. There's no security. Ms. Clausen's office is locked up like Fort Knox, but everything else is just wide open. I mean, they've put tape over the front of the Pepsi machine that was broken, but those are the only changes we've seen. Um, I have some of the codified laws, which I understand are subject to interpretation. My interpretation on a couple of them, um, sorry, I'm a little nervous. Um, codified Law 35-2-6.6, intoxication not to be permitted on licensed premises. No licensee may permit any person to become intoxicated on the premises described on the license. Mr. Abibi has been asked multiple times by the police department to sell his beer in six packs rather than single cans because maybe then they'll go in, buy a six pack and go home and drink so that way everybody else that's standing on the corner doesn't try and take beers from them or bum cigarettes from him, and that'll help with the problem. He refuses to do that. His idea is to you know, blame some of the other business owners. None of the business owners in our part of the building have the police calls that Mr. Abibi does. They don't have the complaints. They have never had problems. Lucky Lady Casino has been in business for, I think, 21 years? I think they've been at our space for quite a while. Um, the other one is 35-2-11.1, recommendation by the local board for suspension or revocation of the license, grounds action by the secretary. I understand that the council isn't going to revoke or suspend his license, that it's the option of the secretary. All I ask is that you've taken it off of the agenda and it now has a spotlight on it. And then... Allison. Yes. Thank you very much. Am I running out of time? You've done, I'm sorry. Uh, you've done a good job. Thank you. No problem. Is there Thank anyone you. else who wanted to speak uh, in opposition of the Mercado receiving their license renewal? Very good. Uh, is there anyone who just wanted to speak on this topic? Yes. Please come forward. Ms. Clausen? I would just like to say. Uh, that she said that she had contacted the owners of that building uh, with ideas. We haven't heard anything now. She talked to Beli. We didn't know anything about it. We have had problems there with, uh, I mean, I know the people that she's talking about down there, we are constantly calling the police as a matter to get them away from the property. Um, there is a, uh, I can't think of what it's called. I have a regular job my wife might know. Uh, that The police will sign something to keep these people off and not allow them back and we do that. Um, but it doesn't stop those people from getting drunk wherever they do that and come there and hang out. We call the police and have them hauled away. Very good. And Mr. Clausen, you're the owner of the building, you and your, your wife. Yes. Okay, very good. And Allison, uh, just quickly, just so we can uh, have clarification, who was it that you contacted or you attempted to contact and received no and no uh, response back from? Was that the Claussons or was that Mr. Abibi? I have the copy of my email that I sent to leashrealestate at hotmail.com. I also cc'd Officer Larson in my email and then I also have a copy of my email to Officer Larson that talks about I've emailed Dawn, tried to call her, let's do the walkthrough anyways, I'm hoping on Monday afternoon is still good for you. And Very I have good. both of those. Very good, thank you, thank you. 
Uh, yes, Mr. Clausen. I would guess I'd like to meet with her and we can just exchange information to get phone calls. We might have missed an email. So. Very good. Mr. Abibi, did you want to say something before we Sorry. turn it out of the council? <laughs> Sorry before I got the motion. That's all right. Uh, <laughs> really, uh, I've been in that location almost nine years. Uh, I never violated any things. Uh, if you ask me re to bring petition from the neighborhood who I give them service, I can bring for you guys 10,000 petition. They like the service. They like what I'm doing there. I'm doing bill payment system. I'm doing waste money wiring system. I'm doing phone business. I'm doing a lot of things, not only one item, just waiting the drunkards. I hate the drunkards to stay on my property in front of my, on that business. I did seven times, I called police, I, I put a strict order to do not see them over there. In her property, there is two business, two years, guaranteed liquor license. Did they call the police and make a restriction order? No, those people who I drive them now, where they hang out? In that area. That is a witness. She never come to me. She never talked with me. But now she's trying to give a business for her tenants and make me out of one thing what I want to tell you. I am a retailer, okay. I'll get staff's items, the same item, just like any other convenience stores from licensed distributors. There is no Mercato man, then liquor or drink. And nobody can tell me what to sell, how much I sell. That is a business ethics. I will not accept that. I do properly, just like any convenience store in Seaforce. There is no any difference. I accept from distributors, I am a retailer, I will put price, I will sell it. Zero feet, the next door, that is liquor license, Business, they do the same even they copy me. What is wrong from what I did wrong? Why is she isolated? She did not condemn even the next what they have, only me. Right. Thank you very much. Mr. Bibi, thank you very much. Council, I'm not going to move on to you. Uh, we've had good dialogue, of course, uh, from the folks in the audience. I'm going to turn it over to you. Any questions that I, Councilor Antiman? I'd like to have, uh, I see uh, Assistant Chief uh, Lyons here. Uh, do we have a representative from the police department that can speak to this, Patty? Can you explain to us a little bit, you know, about, uh, about some of the efforts that have been made by the police department and the response that we've had from the businesses uh, in, the, in the buildings right around there? Sure. Uh, Lieutenant Galen Smith, Northwest Quadrant Commander. Um, this past spring, uh, the weather was abnormally nice, about April and we started to notice some large congregations in that area, which isn't uncommon. Um, it, it's an area that, that we have had issues with uh, year after year in the spring. So we took concentrated efforts uh, with saturation patrols, uh, meeting with the business owners, meeting with Ellison and, and Nick, and uh, trying to come up with a game plan on how we can keep this from escalating into further issues. Um, I feel we've, we've had pretty good success from a police department standpoint in, in managing uh, uh, the area. Uh, there is a large call volume in that area. Um, a lot of that is generated by our police officers uh, work in the area and, and uh, initiating the proactive activity. Uh, we do a lot of foot patrol in that area, probably more foot patrol in that area, well I know in, in that area than in any area of the northwest part of town. Uh, we've met with the businesses. Uh, with the mayor in, in his chambers, and we've also met with the neighborhood group uh, prior to that uh, to vote, have, hear their concerns and to address them as well. Uh, call volume um, for the actual Mercado store uh, is a high number compared to the rest of the strip mall. And I attribute that to, uh, two ways because the police department is, is focusing more in that area, but it's, it, it's on a corner. So it's easier for those people, once they buy their merchandise, to stand on the corner before they move on. Most of the uh, calls uh, are tagged as disorderly subject calls, uh, but that covers a pretty wide area. When our officers go out with a group, it's tagged as a disorderly subject type call. Um, 
Councilor Enneman, follow up. Uh, some of the calls, has the Mercado, I, I noticed they held up a number of the uh, trespassing uh, violations that uh, you've implemented just recently. H has the Mercado called you on a number of occasions too because of the, uh, of what's happening in the outside of store? Yeah, once, once we implemented that form this past summer, uh, we introduced it to the businesses. Um, the trespassing law has always been on the books. Uh, but it's something more that an officer awareness type thing. If they know somebody's not supposed to be there that they've trespassed, they'll go and handle it. But another officer who comes may not have known that that officer did that. So we implemented this form that we actually have the officer sign uh, with the business's uh, signature as well. And then once that individual is observed, they will trespass. And yes, Mr. Uh, Belay has trespassed people from his property once that form. More prevalent in September, the first part of October, after we had our meeting, uh, he was very proactive in, in working with the police department shortly after that meeting. Yeah. Councilor Sagers. Yeah, you mentioned that he's more proactive now. Are you saying that this, these uh, issues have declined uh, during the past several months or not? The actual call volume, um, well, yeah, just to give you an example to that business address, uh, in July we were at, well, in May we were at 75 calls at Mercado's. Uh, June 35, July 42, 36, 37, 30, and a uh, month to date 17. Um, and that's just to that location. So, you know, and, and you can attribute that without breaking down each individual call. Uh, uh, don't be mistaken that all of those calls were made by that store. Uh, some may be from uh, a neighbor across the street. Uh, and I would say over half of those calls are officer initiated calls. Uh, we have officers, if you ever drive that area, a kitty corner across the street, there's a vacant lot. It's pretty rare that you won't drive by there and see a police car sitting there. And, and they may just be sitting there doing their reports, but they have visual. Uh, when I'm out and about driving my car, if I pull in the lot, um, if there's people in there, they do scatter. So, so they're very familiar that the police department is there. And Ellison has said that, too. With the, she sees the police there a lot. So. Councilor Stangers. So is it fair to say that uh, 75 calls in May and then during the summer months, when you think calls would go up, they've gone down dramatically. Well, and, and that's to that specific location. Mm -hmm. You know, the 300, 400 block of South Summit is right around the corner, which encompasses Mr. Clausen's laundromat. You know, we get calls there as well. So it may not be right to 631. It might be 308 South Summit or 316 South Summit across the street. Um, so there's call volume in the 300 to 400 block of South Summit that's... Um, about the same as what it would be at Mercado. Councilor Anderson, Jr. Officer, since I've been on the council, we've had numerous discussions about that area and come up with different types of plans on how to make that area more secure for individuals. Uh, right now, as, as I've seen it, and I go through that area almost every day, uh, it has been cleaned up a little bit. What more could we do? Um, that's a great question. Um, we're, we're doing a lot. Uh, and I think, uh, as, as you folks all know, uh, we, we initiated uh, a new police concept in January. We call it our team policing. Um, by having a quadrant commander like myself and Lieutenant Burns and a couple others, uh, I know the Northwest area very, very well. I know the people very well. I've, I've, uh, they know me. They know the officers. The officers have taken ownership in this, in this team policing concept. Uh, Ellison knows them by name. Uh, Belay knows some of the officers by name. They're in there a lot. So uh, from a police department standpoint, um, I think the plan that we have going forward is very, very good. Is there work to be done? There certainly is work to be done. We can't just walk away from it. Um, uh, I don't know if it's ever going to be like uh, the southeast part of town where I live where it's, you can just walk outside and not have that. And just because of, of, of where it's at, you know, and, and the people that live in that area are, tend to be out and about a lot. And, um, and with the alcohol being served in those stores, they're, they're walking around and, and it, it is what it is. But we've made significant progress with, with how we're policing it. Uh, the lighting is a good idea. Uh, yeah, and, and maybe um, Mr. I, Cooper has some ideas on, on how to do it. And, I, and I also see the city's investment in that area with the, the new apartments right complex. Down, beautiful. Yeah. Correct. The, that there and the new one that's going to be on Duluth and, you know, tr just reinvesting it back into that neighborhood to try to 
revitalize it. There's a home that was another bought step. about a half a block down that the mayor, I shared an email with him of, of an individual that bought that house and, and they're doing some, some mission work out of that house. So it's deals like that. Uh, there's an individual in the 800 block of West 12th Street, a couple of them that have taken ownership that are starting a crime prevention program with Officer Larson. So they've been working with them. Uh, 800 block West 12th, we trim trees, we put high, uh, higher wattage bulbs with the lighting department. We've got a lot of uh, team departments that have been focusing on this area. I think we've come a long way since the spring of 2012, where we're at today. Um, and it's just keep doing and progressing step by step with where we need to go. Councilor, I've seen you. And then the last thing, what more could this business owner do to help you make that corner more secure? Um, it, it's, you know, it's his business and, and he needs to, to take ownership of his business. He needs to work together with his neighbors. You know, I, I hate to see every entity in that place just thinking of themselves because it's not that. I guess my recommendation would just be to, to work well with your neighbors and be open to suggestions of, of how you can not only improve your business but improve the neighborhood too. So. Councilor Rolfing. Yes, I have a, a question for um, Belay. You can come up here, please. Um, and this is kind of curiosity, but it also has a, might mean nothing, might mean something. Um, had an opportunity a number of years ago, almost 10 years ago, or I guess eight years ago now, to go to Africa and, and um, be, have some dealings with some businesses and things there. But I'm just wondering what, uh, what the word Mercado means? Uh, it is a Latin word, market. Market? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I didn't know. I just wanted to, wanted to know. So you're, you're uh, a market trying to do a lot of different things for a lot of different people there? Yeah. Okay. okay. And I, I really uh, have a lot of customers. They like to come there okay. and they enjoy the service. Okay. That's right, Laura. Mr. Mayor, I move that we uh, approve the renewal of the Mercado um, liquor license. Second, Anderson. There's been a motion to approve uh, uh, the Mercado liquor license by Councilor Aguilar, seconded by Councilor Anderson, Jr. Is there any further discussion, Councilor Anderson? Yeah, um, I'd just like to make a brief statement here. You know, I think one thing about it is that we're, we are a small community, a small town in, in some respects. And I think we all want to look at how we can better our town. And especially in an area like this, we really are a small community. And it does take a lot of people. What, what we've found as a city council is that our hands are really tied when it comes to dealing with some of these instances. And what we're really looking for are some answers. We're just, we have a lot of questions to ask the people about their businesses. We want to encourage people to, to, to take and communicate. We want to encourage people to cooperate and to make our community better. And when we ask an opportunity like this to address places where we know we have had issues, that's what we're really trying to put across to people, is what we're trying to accomplish, right. is to be able to communicate and be good citizens and be part of our community as a whole. So I will endorse this. I would hope that the neighbors continue to work towards improving. We've seen some improvements, uh, and I would like to encourage to continue. There has been a, mo there has been a motion to approve this. It has been seconded. Uh, if there is no further discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council Members Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Entman? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. And then it's passed 7 to 0. Item 18. All right. Item 18 is a new 2012 2013 retail malt beverage license for Afeco Inc. Vishnu Bunny Tattoo, 202 South Phillips Avenue with conditional use permit 2012 being approved on October 3rd, 2012. Jamie? Good evening again. Um, just a little background on this. Um, as always, applicants are required to um, submit an al alcohol application checklist when they are interested in applying for a license. And when he did that, um, he specified on that checklist that he was interested in um, providing alcohol at bi-monthly events, um, such as um, artist showings and such. Um, just, 
just for a little background, I know the owner, um, Jeff Mann, is present here in the audience um, if you have any questions for him. Um, also, um, with the conditional use permit, he was required to submit a security management plan, which he did, and it was, I believe, attached to the electronic agenda. Jamie, thank you. I'm going to start with uh, those in favor of, uh, of this. Uh, Jeff, if you would come forward, please. Did you want to speak to, on behalf of your business to the council, or would you prefer to wait for questions? Um, yeah. Please come forward. Thank you. My name is Jeff Mann, and uh, I own Vishnu Bunny Tattoo and Third Eye Gallery. Um, I, I think the main thing that I want to address, and I uh, have kind of heard things through the grapevine downtown, and I think there's a little bit of a misconception that I'm trying to become a bar downtown, which is absolutely uh, not the case. Um, as all galleries everywhere, first Friday of every month is uh, you put new art up and you celebrate it, and there's there's, uh, you know, you, you have beer and food or wine and cheese, and uh, I, we just want to be able to function in that capacity. Um, uh, we're very aware with our health license, we actually can't have open containers while we function as a tattoo shop. And this is, we're just looking for one night a month and just very rarely a, a, a different special occasion on which we're going to, I mean, we cease all of our tattooing, you know, all of our functionality in that capacity. Uh, we close down and we open up and we have our, our gallery opening event. Um, we've kind of had a little bit of a learning curve trying to, you know, get into the downtown community. And we want to have these events and, and find our way to fit in and contribute to the community at large down there. Um, I, I, I think that's all I have for now. So. Thank you, Jeff. Don't go too far. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wanted to speak on behalf of uh, Vishnu Bunny in terms of uh, this application? Very good. Uh, is there anyone who wanted to speak in opposition of this? If you would come forward, please. Welcome. Hi, Mayor. Um, council members, my name is Cindy Pileshi. I am a business and property owner in downtown Sioux Falls. I own Young and Richards Flower Shop, and my husband and I live above it. I am representing 20-plus uh, business and property owners in downtown Sioux Falls. And um, what we want to say is that D Sioux Falls has done such a fantastic job of re of creating the downtown Sioux Falls that it is when it destroyed the Louvre, all of that. And downtown Sioux Falls has become such a wonderful place to be. Right now, we are concerned about there being a high concentration, saturation level of alcohol consumption areas. In just a two and a half block space, there's greater than 12 places that they can consume alcohol now. We don't want to increase that because we think that that is counterproductive to the downtown Sioux Falls environment that we want to propagate. Right now, um, Vishnu Bunny, they, we, have, we are not opposed to them operating business at all as they are. We just are opposed to increasing alcohol consumption on the occasions, like the most recent on uh, the night of the zombie walk when Vishnu Bunny did serve alcohol and had bands and kegs. They had put out on their Facebook page that they want, were looking for people for security, crowd control, bath salt distributors. That's the type of thing that we do not want downtown because we're trying to promote the clean, safe environment that downtown, downtown is switching to, and we want to promote that. And so that's what we are opposed to as far as increased alcohol consumption is not good for, you know, what's there is already there. That's great. There's no, we have no problem with tattoo shop. We just don't want any more of the alcohol. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wanted to speak in opposition? Welcome. Larry Rayfeld, 210 South uh, Phillips Avenue. Uh, what I wanted to make the council aware of is that I don't believe the Planning Commission would have given an approval had they, had we had the opportunity to visit with them and express our concerns. There was no uh, notice given of the Planning Commission meeting, and I would even question whether you can even take action tonight, and that's obviously not my, uh, my pay grade to make that decision, but um, we were unaware of the Planning Commission meeting was going to take on this uh, 
um, particular application. Uh, and there's, you know, the summary of the problem, but there's also the, uh, I mean, there's a lot more information that we could provide too as to why we oppose. I, mean, I may be wrong, but I'm assuming we have to get permission. We have to get notification. Larry, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Cooper, would you have any answer or any response to that? Larry, thanks for bringing that to attention. Uh, Mike Cooper, Planning and Building Services. The Planning Commission took action on a conditional use permit at their October 3rd, 2012 regular monthly meeting, and that was based on our new process of sending out letters to all property owners. And so the city staff did that as per all the other items that we would have the Planning Commission review. And we did not receive any public testimony. Mike, you're gonna have to explain that in, in more detail. Uh, sending- The city staff is required to send out a letter to all property owners within 500 feet. So you believe that was done? I know it was done, yes, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, did you want to speak on in opposition on the vision of Bunny Lane? Well, well, my name is James Jacobson, Thanks, Mayor, James. Commission uh, members. Um, just in response to Mr. Cooper, um, I'm one of the partners at 204 South Phillips Avenue, the market on Phillips. Um, we don't own our building, so when you send out letters to property owners who actually happen to own the property that is being rented and asking the renovations, we never heard of it. We had no idea until a sign went up on the back door, I think two days before the hearing. So we didn't have an opportunity to speak at that time regarding the uh, issues either. My concern isn't necessarily that they're going to serve, you know, uh, wine or beer a couple of times a month. My concern is, and I have talked to a person in the city planning office as well, there's no restriction for that. Um, there's nothing contained within this that would prevent them from simply opening up a bar at this point once they get the wine and beer license because there's no stipulation in there. If there's a stipulation in there that it was only once or twice a month, I don't think that there'd be any issue with this. So, thank you. Thank you, James, appreciate it. <coughs> Ms. Rayfield, just one second, please, if you don't mind. Folks, is there anyone else who wanted to speak in opposition of this? Very good. Mr. Rayfield, please come forward. Thank you. Just to clarify, a letter was sent with an address of 201 South Phillips, which would be the investment center in the corner. Um, so that really wasn't taken seriously because nobody, and then once I learned that, obviously they weren't doing anything, somebody else was, I fully assumed and expected I would get a proper letter with the proper address. So um, that's why we just did not know this was coming up. It kind of blindsided us. So Mr. Rayfeld, you're saying that the letter that you received from the Planning and Zoning Office was for a completely different property? Yes. 201 South Phillips. Right, across the street, um, Dean McGowan's building. Very good. Corner there. Thank you. Cindy, did you want to say something as well? If you would please come, come to the microphone, please. I just want to say that we are within 500 feet and we did not receive any letter. And are you the uh, owner of the building? Yes. You're the owner of the building? Yes. Very good. Thank you. Mike, did you have any uh, follow-up comments? <laughs> no, I'm just going by what um, was my understanding that we did the proper notification. We did receive calls uh, before the Planning Commission hearing. In, in the case that you, not you, I apologize, Mike. Sure. In the case that the City of Sioux Falls uh, Planning and Zoning Department did make a mistake and sent the letter to, a, uh, sent the letter with a wrong address, do you have any recommendations on what we should do going forward? Then we could, uh, well, first of all, we would go back and verify if in fact we did not correctly make notification, which okay. I will certainly do tomorrow morning. Uh, if we do determine that it was incorrectly notified, then I think the next action would be to go back to the Planning Commission and have a new public hearing on the conditional use permit 
for the alcohol license. Okay. That would be my recommendation. Ms. Cooper, thank you. Mm -hmm. Council, uh, I'm going to leave this in your hands. I, I've just done my part just to try to bring forward to this point, and, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to first to Councilor Karski and then uh, Councilor uh, Jameson. Councilor Karski. Mike, don't go far. Um, along with the requirements for the letter, they have to post a sign also on their building two weeks' notice. Isn't that correct? Ten days. Ten days. Mm -hmm. Ten days before the meeting. Yep. Uh, anybody that checks to see if that's done? Yes, or? there's an affidavit, and yes. Okay, so we know the sign was on the building. For a conditional least. use permit. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, Councilor Jamison. If I could uh, just ask the applicant if the applicant is willing to do a do-over and, and willing to wait. The council has a decision to move on and, and handle this, but I'd like to know if, if the applicant is willing to wait. That's right there. Um, sir, if you would come, Jeff, if you wouldn't mind, I'm sorry. Just the people of Sioux Falls are intrigued by this as well, and we want to hear what you have to say. Um, I, uh, frankly, I, I guess I don't understand what exactly the ramifications would be of uh, doing that. I mean, I know I, I did my part. I remember posting the signs on the 23rd because it was the day before my birthday. So, Jeff, thank you. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this over to two parties who can help us answer uh, that. Uh, I'm going to start with Mr. Cooper, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, City Attorney uh, Fifley. Mr. Cooper, could you try to address what Councilor Jamison uh, is is talking about, as well as help Jeff through this process? Sure. Um, in this case, the the use of that property for the sale of alcohol does require a conditional use permit. There's no question about that, and so. Um, when we were presented to this, presented this at the Planning Commission, it was discussed that this was for one or two occasions per month was the intent. Uh, the Planning Commission chose not to put that stipulation on there. Um, that certainly could be done the second time around. There could be more stipulations. As you can see up there on the slide, the only stipulation was the normal security management plan that we would typically require. So we could, we could take it back for two reasons. One would be for the proper notification if that was not done. And second of all, to review if there should be additional stipulations. Um, the other thing that I would just, well, I'll just stop there. Mr. Cooper, could uh, one of the stipulations be, and, and I, I hope you, you understand, could one of the stipulations be that the Vishnu Bunny would not be allowed to do any tattoo work uh, at the time that the alcohol is being consumed? I think there's already statutes, but yes, uh, no, we, we could, you could replicate, also, yes, okay, just to Dave, reinforce that. I'm now going to turn it over to City okay. Attorney Dave Fifely, and then I'm going to turn it back to the Council, I swear, Councilor Staggers, hang in there. Thank you. Thank you City Mayor. Attorney Fifley. Uh, first of all, our State Supreme Court has said in other instances that a notice statute, they only demand substantial compliance, not strict compliance, and I anticipate for our ordinance here since the 10 day posting was done and so forth that that would be substantial compliance. However, this is an application for a new license. It's not an application for renewal. So if you do decide to remand it back to the uh, planning commission, there would be ample time to go back through the, that process and it would not affect uh, the, the liquor license. If it were a renewal, then we'd have a much bigger issue because we'd have to do it by December 31st. But since it's application for a new, li uh, a new license, it's a totally different animal. So I hope that explains it. Councilor Staggers. Yeah, I guess my primary concern is sending it back to the Planning Commission. They've already gone through the process following state law, even though we might have had a situation with the uh, Planning Department maybe having some difficulty there, but the Planning Commission made a decision. And now we're saying we're going to send it back. I'm just concerned about due process here. Because we know the fact, we're beginning to know the facts here on the City Council, so we can, we can correct the situation if need be, but sending it back to the Planning Commission doesn't seem to be the best thing to do. Very good. Yes, Councilor Enneman. If you don't mind, I have a question for the applicant too, if you don't mind. Please, Jeff. Jeff, please. Could you tell me, um, and, and I understand, 
It's my understanding the way that alcohol licenses work, quite honestly. The only way you can have one if, you're, if you don't have it apply through this process is that you've got to be a charitable or fraternal organization. I understand that a retailer can't just apply for a temporary one unless it's done for charity. But can you tell me a little bit, explain a little bit about your security plan. Sometimes um, there's uh, issues that come up when you have events. And, and I know we, uh, you heard Mr. Mullenberg probably talked about the fact that he has off-duty officers. Is it your intent to, to provide that kind of security to, for an event that you might have? Um, I, honestly, I haven't looked into uh, using off-duty officers for that. Um, I do have a, a pool of people I know that work their regular job as security and door people at bars, and I uh, would every event I would have uh, at least two of them who are experienced sitting at my front and back door, making sure that that uh, IDs are checked. Um, and then I do have my uh, shop staff who are I have worked in that capacity in years past, and. Uh, and, and frankly, from the size of the events, and we are actually looking to shorten the events that we're doing, I, we're, we're not looking to have these be events where uh, these issues come up. So, Sure, I understand. Jeff, could you tell me a little bit about yourself? How long have you been in business, and how many artists do you have working for you? Um, I've been in business in Sioux Falls for 13 years. Uh, we have five of us that work at the shop. Um, Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Councilor Jansen. Jeff, if I could, the, uh, the real question I think that might come around here is the, uh, the neighbors are concerned about an undue concentration of uh, alcohol establishments in the downtown area. Uh, you're talking about only having alcohol or serving beer two nights or so a week. Is that or one night? Uh, it? It actually, regularly one night a month, uh, the first Friday of every month for a gallery opening. So one of the things that could maybe move this along is if you were willing to agree to that. I, I would absolutely stipulate to that. <clears throat> um, I, and another thing that's pertinent, I, we really do try to keep our events so, so as to not really start until most of the, the retailers that function normally during the day are closed. Um, and, you know, like I said, we, we've kind of looked to shorten our events a little bit and, and, and really fit a niche to where if we have uh, an event, uh, we kind of get in, have our event, we're done. We have people downtown. If they want to go explore and experience the rest of downtown, that's, that, that's what, uh, how we're looking to contribute by doing what we're doing. Um, and, you know, additionally, we, we try and take every effort to patrol the businesses and make sure that we're not leaving uh, mess, we're not causing issues uh, in our stretch of the neighborhood down there. Councilor Aguilar. Um, it's my understanding that you cannot stipulate if we give them a license that it only be used once a month. Could someone answer that, whether that's true or whether I'm under a <laughs> misconception? It's Fifley or, or Ms. Cooper. Or maybe even Lori can answer that. Uh, Lori, the question is, can we stipulate to a, um, someone who's got a liquor license how often they can serve alcohol? No, you cannot. The, the state law allows licenses, you know, to uh, this particular type of license to operate from 7 a.m. to 2 a.m. Um, each day of the week. However, stipulations can be placed on the conditional use permit um, regulating hours, and that has been done, but it cannot be done on the actual license. Is there anyone else who wants to speak before I go back to Councilor Enneman? Very good. Councilor Enneman. Jeff, just one more thing. You mentioned that your events, you're trying to tighten up the timeline. And when you say a timeline, give me an example about from when do you, do you open for your, for your studio displays and when do you plan on closing? Uh, a, a typical first Friday, we'll open at noon. We'll function as a tattoo shop till 6 o'clock, 6.30. Uh, we then close down. We'll kind of make some changes to our space and how we're going to function and we reopen we'll do either 7 to 10 8 to 11 something that falls sort of within that that area but we're okay. thank you yep. council we've had some really good dialogue on this topic uh, wanted to see if anybody would be willing to make a motion on this particular item 
I move to approve, Entman. Councilor Evans made a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. second there is a second. Councilor uh, Jameson, did you have a comment? If I, well, I Go ahead, need, sir. If I could, just need clarification. If the, if the council approves the uh, license tonight and it goes back to the Planning Commission, it would never go back. No. Once it's done, it's done. So the stipulation that would be, that what the applicant is willing to do, uh, that the neighbors would want, it would have to be done somewhere else. So we'd have to deny it tonight, make it go back to the Planning Commission. I just need clarification on the votes, please. Mike, would you mind coming forward, please? And uh, let's talk through this. Uh, Councilor Jameson has asked a legitimate question. Uh, if it is uh, voted down and they went back through the process, uh, could you help explain uh, that to the people of Sioux Falls? Yes, the, the process would be that we could um, get them on the December Planning Commission meeting to rehear the conditional use permit with the, the, the proper notification. City Attorney Fifely. For the first time ever, I'm going to try ask, asking a question. What, would the six-month time frame before they can reapply for a cup no, that's if it's here. denied. If it's denied in total. And aren't we talking about a denial here? We're talking Is about a, a denial of the license and not the conditional <gasps> use. Okay. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Councilor Rolfing. However, um, uh, Councilor Greg, uh, Jameson, if we do this and allow the, um, the liquor license, the beer license, that does not, even if the, the CUP conditional use permit says they can do it once a month, that has no bearing whatsoever on how many days they can sell liquor or beer in that because the state law says they can sell as much beer as they want. So the CUP means nothing. Okay. Are we clear mm -hmm. on that? According to what was said by uh, Lori Hoxted. And so sending it back means nothing. What takes precedence is the state law, which says we give them a license. They can sell as much beer as they want from 7 o'clock in the morning until 2 o'clock, or 7 o'clock in the morning to 2 o'clock the next morning, seven days a week. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I would say that to dive into this even further, that since the conditional use permit is a land use issue, and the land use is the sale of alcohol, then we can put conditions on that use. That would be my opinion. Call the question. There has been a motion to approve this item. It has been seconded. Uh, there's been a considerable amount of debate. Uh, we will have a roll call vote, please. Council members Aguilar? No. Anderson? Yes. Entman? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? No. Rolfing? No. Staggers? Yes. Uh, that, has, that item has passed four to three. Uh, item number 19. All right. All right, item 19 is a new 2013 package liquor license for Wang Enterprises, Inc., Kings Mart, to be operated at 4200 West 41st Street. Item 20 is a new 2012-13 package malt beverage South Dakota Farm Winery license for Jamie Reif, Traveling Wines by CJ, to be operated at 1603 West 12th Street. 21 is request to add video lottery terminals to the retail malt beverage license for Stanton, Inc., the log cabin, to be operated at 1515 West Burnside Street. Item 22, special one-day liquor license for Ovations Food Services, LP, to be operated at the Avera Central Office, 3900 West Avera Drive, for an Avera Health Annual Holiday Party on December 7, 2012. 
Item 23, special one-day wine license for Senior Citizen Services, Inc. to be held at Active Generations, 2300 West 46th Street for the Cocktails and Canvas Art Class on December 4, 2012. Item 24, special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for Senior Citizen Services, Inc. to be operated at Active Generations, 2300 West 46th Street for the Gourmet Guys Fundraiser on April 21, 2013. Jamie. Good evening. Um, item 19 um, is, currently has a package uh, malt license and would just merely like to add the package liquor. Um, Jamie Reef Traveling Wines by CJ. Um, the applicant is present if anybody has any questions about, um, about her request. And item 21 um, is the log cabin is requesting to add video lottery terminals. They, in the past, they did have them, but they worked on an arrangement um, with a, another establishment in the area um, and transferred those um, lottery machines to that business. But however, now they want those back. And the um, applicant did submit a letter um, that I did forward to all the council members earlier today. Um, he was not able to be here tonight due to health issues. So, and the others are um, three special one days. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Is there anyone in the audience who wanted to speak to these items? Council, questions or comments or motions? Move to approve, Anderson. It's been a motion to approve these items. Second. Seconded by Councilor Antiman. Any discussion? A roll call vote, please. Council members Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Entiman? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rothing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. And that is passed 7 to 0. Item number 25. 25 is second reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the revised ordinances of the city to update and further define restricted concealed weapons. Keith Allenstein, Assistant City Attorney. Um, this is second reading on an ordinance to eliminate uh, our attempt to prohibit uh, possession of firearms within the city and also to clarify what weapons can be carried under what circumstances. Um, this was a June 12th public services uh, ordinance and then information on the 6th and first reading on the 13th. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Is there anyone in the audience who wanted to speak to this item? It is a second reading. Very good. Council, I'll leave it in your hands. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Council Rolfing. Uh, just one thing I'd like to reiterate that I would hope that the council would, not council, but the attorney would uh, work with the Municipal League in hopes of getting this uh, through the legislature next year so that we can uh, do our own legislation along these lines. Thank you. Thank you, Council Rolfing. Mr. Mayor. Councilor Aguilar. I move approval. Second Entman. It's been a motion to approve. Seconded by Councilor Entman. Uh, any further discussion? A roll call vote, please. Council members Aguilar. Yes. Anderson. Yes. Entman. Yes. Jameson. Yes. Karski. Yes. Rolfing. Yes. Staggers. Yes. And that is passed 7 to 0, item 26. 26 is second reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending Chapter 1, General Provisions, and Chapter 27, Parks and Recreation of the revised ordinances of the city by removing specific penalty, restricting use of remote control aircraft, amending exceptions to park hours, and removing references to board. Kelby. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Kelby Maris with Parks and Recreation. The proposed ordinance changes before you tonight. Uh, one deals with a general penalty. Uh, we would strike the language in uh, Section 1-4 that refers to Faywick Park. Basically, this language uh, doubles the penalty for a violation uh, in Faywick Park. Um, don't have a great history on, or a handle on the history of this uh, ordinance, um, but as I've been told by other park staff, that this probably dates back to a time when uh, Faywick Park, where we had several issues at Faywick Park, uh, back when it was uh, heavily wooded and the terrain was different than what it is today. Uh, we don't typically see uh, any issues with violations at Faywick Park uh, today. So we would propose that we strike that, that language out of Section 1. Uh, there are five uh, sections in Chapter 27 in which we are uh, proposing that we would strike pursuant to policy established by the board. 
Uh, this language dates back to a time when the Park Board approved uh, operational procedures and expenditures uh, versus their current role now uh, as an advisory board. And this would make language then consistent throughout uh, the Chapter 27. Another proposed change that we are proposing tonight is uh, within Chapter 27-11, it, um, it would add remote control aircraft to a list of activities uh, that would require a permit from the director. Uh, basically what we're after here is trying to uh, ensure that park users that are gonna enjoy this activity in our park system are doing so at an appropriate time and an appropriate location. Uh, Permits are free to the public. Um, they're written, able to be written by any of our management staff. So um, we, I mean, we typically don't have many issues, but uh, remote control aircraft have grown in size and some of these aircraft can have a wingspan of over six feet and weigh upwards of 200 pounds. And uh, somebody who'd want to enjoy that activity in the park system, we just want to make sure that they're doing it at an appropriate time in an appropriate location. Uh, the most significant changes that we're proposing are hours, parks are open to the public. Uh, current language has um, Falls Park is open between 5 and 10 p.m. when daylight savings time is in effect and, or, or when daylight savings time is not in effect and until midnight when daylight savings time is in effect. We're just proposing that Falls Park be open from 5 o'clock in the morning until midnight year-round. Uh, with the Winter Wonderland display, we see a lot of people traveling through the park even now after 10 o'clock, even though the park is technically closed, and we just would uh, like the ordinance to reflect that, that we're encouraging people to enjoy the display as it's on until, until midnight. Uh, we would also recommend that the, we add the Downtown River Greenway from Falls Park to East 10th Street on the east side of the Big Sioux River and have that be open from 5 o'clock until midnight year-round also. Uh, with the improvements that are being made through the downtown Greenway, it would just fit with those uses that we wouldn't uh, have any issues with anybody on that stretch of the Greenway um, until midnight. Uh, current ordinance language also lists that Faywick Park uh, is closed between 11 and 5 during daylight savings time and is 10 to 5 the rest of the year. We're just uh, asking that Favic Park be in with the uh, rest of the parks outside of Falls Park and it, it is closed from 10 o'clock to 5 o'clock year round. Uh, we don't have any, any issues at Favic Park uh, the rest of the year, so we, we feel that that would be appropriate. Final change in this section uh, would allow scheduled events to continue past the closing time of the park as approved uh, by the director. It is our current practice that uh, league play, tournaments, special events do go past the closing uh, times of, of the park, and we're just uh, proposing that we put that practice in ordinance so that we've got something to back up our current practice. I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Kelby, thank you very much. Before we move on to the council, I did want to, uh, this is a second reading. I wanted to offer an opportunity for anybody in the audience to speak. I do think that there is at least one gentleman who wanted to speak. If we could get the microphone ready for him, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Young man, welcome. Uh, it's now 10 minutes to 9, way past your bedtime, at least mine. Uh, but uh, you've been very patient, so welcome. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself to the people of Sioux Falls. Hello, my name is Mason Helm, and I'm a fifth grader at Harvard Elementary, a student council member and a Weeblo scout with PAC 260. I am here to voice my opinion about this amendment. Under, the, under this type of amendment, these types of remote control aircrafts would not be able to, able to fly in all city parks. I think the city would be better served by an amendment that would only apply to, to aircrafts of a larger size. Please vote no on this amendment as I've asked Santa and my parents for a new remote control helicopter for Christmas. <laughs> very good, very good. It's, thank you very much for your testimony, uh, Mason. We appreciate it. You may want to sit down in case there's some questions later on. Thank you, don't leave. Is there anyone else in the audience who wanted to speak to this item? Very good. Council, I am leaving it in your hands. Councilor Anderman. Yeah. 
Kelly, if you got a question for you. How would you address this young gentleman's request when he shows us these kinds of aircraft? I understand your concern about the larger aircraft because they can definitely be a nuisance. Um, if this young man was flying uh, this aircraft today at any one of our parks, um, we would not approach him looking for his permit. Um, without causing us any issues, there's no reason to, for us to even uh, address the activity. Uh, however, if he was flying those aircraft at a softball tournament in the middle of Sherman Park when there's hundreds of people trying to watch a softball game, it could cause some issues and then we would be looking for a permit and then we would try to find him a more suitable location for that activity. Uh, we're, we're not by any stretch trying to uh, prevent him from flying his aircraft within the park system. We just want to make sure that if uh, he's doing it at a busy time in a busy place that we can f help him find a more suitable location. Thank you. Councilor Anderson, Jr. Kelby, don't go anywhere yet. Uh, Kelby, um, where has this been a problem? Uh, well, over the past several months we've had uh, lots of inquiries and it's simply been one of those things where uh, as we worked through that process of trying to help find them a location, we felt that if we were to establish a permitting process, then we would ensure that we were f helping them with those locations and um, the typical uh, suitable locations and times to do that. Um, again, we're not trying to stifle the activity. We're just trying to make sure that it's done appropriately. Okay, you're saying suitable locations. Where are those locations? Uh, well. Yankton Trail Park, for example, would be an excellent location even for these larger aircraft with the uh, long accessible pathways through the middle of the park. So you know, today, again, would be a, a great example. In the, in the middle of June, it would even be good. The first weekend in June during a soccer tournament would not be a good time for it. So we're just trying to make sure that, uh, that we're being prudent with the activities and trying to, to help them with times and locations. Uh, Again, it's, it's, there's other activities that happen within the park system that, that really fall under the same kind of thing. So, I mean, it's, we're just trying to make sure that we're, we're being responsible. Councilor Stangers. Yeah, this was an issue that was brought up uh, at the last meeting, Mason. And, uh, hey, I'm glad you're here tonight because um, I agree with you. I think we need an amendment here because what we have the Parks Department telling us this evening is they're going to exercise discretion. Well, that means anything they want. So we have to get this down to more clear as to, you know, whether you can use your uh, toy aircraft or not in the parks. And so um, because of that, I'm just going to simply make a motion now that uh, we defer this until December 4th uh, meeting of the City Council. And in that time, we will definitely have an amendment to um, submit for this ordinance. I'd second that motion. It's been a motion to defer this item to December 4th. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been seconded. Is there any further discussion? Mayor? Y yes, Councillor, uh, um, geez, I'm losing it. Karski? Sorry, <laughs> Councillor Karski. And, and Councillor Staggers, I brought this same point up at the informational meeting when this was um, introduced to us. And same concern. These young Cub Scouts, they have a, a remote control plane to fly. It's not the Parks Department that enforces the laws. Typically, I don't think they're going to be down there telling somebody that they can't do it. Um, and I don't think any of these young gentlemen have the means to go and get a permit from the Parks Department when they want to fly their little helicopter or whatever. So for that reason, I support. And I will work with you on that, too. Sounds good. Councilor Rolfing. I would uh, take the opposite stand in that um, these the parks, parks people have to have some kind of authority to be able to say to these people, if they find them uh, out at a soccer game or soccer fields or at the softball fields flying this, this uh, helicopter in the middle of the um, soccer complex, et cetera, with a bunch of people there, uh, right now they have no authority to say you can't do that. Um, and they have to have some discretion to be able to do that, and right now they don't have that. I don't care how big it is or how small it is, uh, they need to be able to do that. So I would urge, uh, urge a, a vote in favor of the, um, the uh, changes the way they are right now. Before I go back to Councilor Staggers, I did want to offer opportunity to uh, anybody else. Councilor Staggers. Yeah, those uh, concerns that uh, Councilman Rolfing has expressed, that's 
part of what the amendment is going to be about, uh, specifically allowing them to do that in the parks, but it, also at the same time, if there's some other event going on which could cause safety problems, yeah, we'll have that as part of the amendment. So how big, if I may, how big do you want this to be? Is it going to be this big or is it going to be this big? And the people are going to have to uh, um, measure them every time before they go out and then do this. So you're not trusting the Parks Department to know when danger is and the little kid to know. There is an amendment uh, on the floor. Uh, it is to defer this item so that additional discussion can be made uh, on this and, and try to come up with a potential amendment. Uh, and it sounds like you'd prefer to do that at a later time versus tonight. So with that in mind, uh, a roll call vote, please. Okay, Council Members Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Entman? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Thank you. That is passed 7 to 0. Item 27. This is second reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, providing supplemental appropriations. Good evening, Chad Hebe with Public Works. One of the revenue streams used to expand arterial streets is the arterial street platting fee. During the first three years of its, of its existence, we collected an average of $275,000 per year. In 2009, we collected slightly more than we budgeted for. And as you can see on the, the graph in front of you, in 2010 and 2011, we collected less than we budgeted for. To date, in 2012, we've collected approximately $968,000. The appropriated amount in the 2012 capital program is $385,000. This is the first year that the platting fee revenue has significantly exceeded the budgeted amount, and this is the first time we have requested a supplemental appropriation for the arterial street platting fee. This ordinance recognized the platting, recognizes the platting fee revenue in excess of that estimated in the program and provides a supplemental appropriation of $550,000. These funds will be used for the design right-of-way acquisition and construction of our key arterial street expansion projects. Thank you, Chad. This is the second reading. Anybody in the audience want to speak to this item? Council? Move for approval, Anderson. Second, Entman. Councilor Anderson, Jr. has made a motion to approve. It has been seconded by Councilor Entman. Any further discussion? A roll call vote, please. Council members Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Entman? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Item 28. All right. This is second reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, approving a joint powers agreement between Lincoln County and the City of Sioux Falls regarding the City's contribution toward the non federal cost share requirement of a hazard mitigation grant award. Good evening, Council. Andy Berg with City Engineering. Uh, I spoke to you last week regarding this uh, joint powers agreement uh, authorizing us to provide $100,000 to Lincoln County for drainage improvements as part of a local match uh, for a grant that they're receiving for a $2 million drainage project down there. We are one of five uh, agencies and groups that they are planning to solicit funds from. Uh, take any questions you might have. Andy, thank you. I, again, a second reading. Uh, any interest in, from the audience? Council, Councilor uh, Staggers? Yes. Uh, Andy, can you say something about this watershed owners group? Uh, are they contributing 100000 also? And I've never heard of this. Sure. No, I don't, the county is working with them on that. They're, they're working with all five of these agencies, uh, basically working through the logistics of it and uh, nailing down that amount of money that they're going to be collecting. Uh, I'm not aware if they've come to a final agreement with the resident group yet as to the dollar amount and if that will be through assessment or how that will function. And also, if I could just ask here, in our red notes, it talks about the money is going to be used for culvert upsizing, pond improvements. Uh, anything else you, are you aware of? Those are the main things. That the drainage improvements are basically improving the conveyance through the system, which is mainly involves uh, culvert improvements. 
uh, I would guess there'll be some channel regrading or reshaping through the waterways and then, yeah, the creation of the uh, pond downstream. Council, anybody want to make a motion? Move for approval, Anderson. Second, Karski. Councilor Anderson, Jr. has made a motion to approve item 28, seconded by Councilor Karski. Uh, Councilor Staggers. Yeah, I'm going to be uh, voting against this. Now, I know a lot of people are saying, well, this is going to be helping when the city eventually gets there, maybe by 2037 or whatever uh, the year might be. But I guess I would say that culvert upsizing and pond improvements we're going to be doing next year in 2013, uh, is that still going to be around or in the same condition as 2037 when we might get there? So what I'm saying is, is when we eventually get there, uh, probably we're going to be making all these changes anyway. This is just for this particular circumstance here. And so I don't think this is really relevant to the city right now. First of all, it's not in the city limits. And so what's going on here is that we're having uh, another government entity, you know, wanting us to contribute money. And this is not becoming, well, this is becoming rather common, uh, where we have other local entities asking us for money. And I think the reason they are is because we have deep pockets. And I don't think this is really appropriate for the city taxpayers to be paying for this right now. We're not even close to being there. Very good. And council, roll call vote, please. Okay, council members Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Entman? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Ralphing? Yes. Staggers? No. That is passed six to one, item 29. Okay, this is first reading for 29, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, a major amendment, petition number 2012-1010, to Chapter 1545070, Plan Development Districts, at northeast corner of West Benson Road and South Westport Avenue, amending the Sanford Sports Complex Plan Development District. Planning Commission recommends approval. This is a petition by Sanford Health to amend their Plan Development Zoning District. Essentially what they're asking us to do is to combine <coughs> two different sub areas into one, which would then uh, go forward with the uses that are allowed, including institutional office, as well as commercial development. So we're combining two areas into one just to simplify their future development process. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Councilor Ehrman. myself. Yeah, okay. Councilor Ehrman is going to recruit himself from this one. Council, would anybody want to make a motion to uh, set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, December 4th at 7 p.m.? So moved. Second, Karski. Councilor Anderson Jr. has made that motion, seconded by Councilor Karski. If there's no further discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council members Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Ralphing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. That is passed 6 to 0, item 30. This is first reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 2201 West 95th Street from the RC Recreation Conservation District to the S Institutional District. Petition number 2012-1006 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. This is a petition by the Harrisburg School District. We've been working with them for some time on this site, which is under construction with both elementary and middle school. They've made some changes to their property lines, and so we're adjusting the zoning to accommodate those changes. Council, would anybody want to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, December 4th at 7 p.m. for this item? So moved, Aguilar. Second, Anderson. Councilor Aguilar has made that motion, seconded by Councilor Anderson, Jr. Is there any further discussion? A roll call vote, please. Council members Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Entman? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Ralphing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Thank you. That is passed 7 to 0, item 31. Right, 31 is first reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the revised ordinances of the city permitting clubhouses. Planning Commission recommends approval. This amendment to the city zoning ordinance has been reviewed by the City Council Land Use Committee. Um, there's a recommendation to take this forward, so we took it to the Planning Commission. Essentially, this would add a new definition of clubhouse and eliminate the existing club and private club definitions that have been in the ordinance for quite some time. And the uses that would be allowed with the new definition include retailing, full service restaurants, on sale alcohol, off sale alcohol without drive up windows. 
Michael, thank you. Uh, would counsel, if there are no questions, would anybody want to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, December 4th at 7 p.m. for this item? So moved, Rolfing. Second, Karski. Councilor Rolfing has made that motion. Seconded by Councilor Karski. If there is no further discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council members Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? No. Entman? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. And that is passed six to one. Item 32. Item 32 is first reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the revised ordinances of the city by revising Appendix A, Subdivision Ordinance. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to thank you for your patience right now before I start. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> this is a, an important topic, and I, uh, we're going to spend some time on it. So, uh, Tonight's discussion will focus on revisions to the subdivision ordinance that affect the construction of subdivisions uh, in the city of Sioux Falls. Tonight I will provide you an overview of the current subdivision construction process. I'll provide you an update on the status of our subdivisions and then introduce the proposed subdivision construction process. Uh, first, I want to we'll just run through who constructs new streets in the city of Sioux Falls. Our arterial streets, uh, like Louise Avenue from 85th to 95th, con is constructed publicly through the capital program. Local and collector streets are constructed privately and dedicated to the city. And the risk to the city and its taxpayers occurs when the developer agrees to construct the improvements and does not fulfill his commitment. When I talk about public improvements, I'm talking about the utilities, uh, the curb and gutter, the street surfacing, the street lights, and any other products or activities required for the construction of a street. Uh, these are the steps in the land development process and are discussed in detail in the subdivision ordinance, uh, but tonight I will focus on the plat process and the associated assurance agreement. A plat is a map of, of a piece of land subdivided into lots, parcels, tracts, blocks, right-of-way, and easements. Once the right-of-way is dedicated, the potential risk to the city and its taxpayers is realized who's going to complete the improvements and if the developer or owner does not. Um, just to kind of illustrate what a plat looks like, if you haven't seen one, this is a bare piece of ground and now you see that the right-of-way has been platted, uh, the lots are platted, uh, and the easements are platted. This is language from the subdivision ordinance uh, that basically says the city will not approve a final plat until the, all the public improvements are completed or the developer has assigned an assurance agreement committing to construct the public improvements within a specified time. Uh, we've required an assurance since 1980. At that time it was just a letter. Uh, in 93 it was changed to an assurance agreement. The agreement is signed by the developer and the mayor, and the developer is required to file that document with the County Register of Deeds. Once it is executed, the developer has agreed to construct all the public improvements. For the majority of subdivisions, and until recently, this agreement has served the city and its taxpayers well. However, the economic recession exposed the weakness of the agreement, and that is there is no financial security that'll fund the improvements if the developer is unable to. In the fall of 2009, we conducted a thorough review of all subdivisions uh, to determine if they were compliance with their associated assurance agreement. In the spring of 2010, we began informal dialogue with the audit compliance developers. During this dialogue, we notified them of their status and requested an updated schedule as to when the improvements would be complete. The most common response at that point was when we start selling lots again. Because we knew what the issues were, uh, we formed a subdivision, a subcommittee of the Infrastructure Review and Advisory Board. 
And we just didn't talk about financial securities. Uh, we wanted to talk about the entire construction process of subdivisions, time frames, warranty periods, inspections, testing, and more. We wanted the construction of subdivisions to be very similar to, to the construction process for public improvements. In May and October of 2011, we sent letters again to the out of compliance developers, again requesting information as to when their commitments would be fulfilled. And once again, the responses did not change. In February of 2012, we filed a notice of claim of interest on 1,050 vacant lots in the out of compliance subdivisions. The purpose was to forewarn the potential lot purchasers of the uncompleted improvements and the potential they could be assessed for the cost of those improvements. When someone purchases a lot, they expect that the public improvements adjoining that lot are complete or will be completed. In July of this year, we sent letters uh, by certified mail out to the out of compliance subdivisions. We requested a meeting and notified them that the subdivisions had to be in compliance by September 30th. During the meetings, we communicated what they needed to do to bring their work, their subdivisions into compliance. They could complete the improvements. They could provide us a financial security. They could agree to suspend building permits in that subdivision or other assurances that we would approve. In July of this year, when the letters were sent, there were 30 subdivisions out of compliance, which equates to 21 miles of streets, with an estimate to complete of $10.2 million. Today, there are 11 subdivisions out of compliance, which equates to 9.2 miles of streets, with an estimate to complete of $3.6 million. The next three sides, slides list the out of compliance subdivisions and the entity that signed assurance agreements for that subdivision. They include Arbor's Edge Edition, the Canterbury Heights Edition, Cherry Creek Heights Edition, Cherry Creek Heights Second Edition, the Green Hills Edition, the Hayward Meadows Edition, the Legacy Ridge Edition, and the North Ridge Edition, the Redstone Village Edition, the Southern Vistas Edition, the Westwood Valley Edition, and the Wild Meadows Edition. The Green Hills Edition, the North Ridge Edition, and the Wild Meadows subdivisions no longer have a developer associated with them. Because of the uncompleted improvements and the risk to the city and its taxpayers, we have begun legal actions against the entity that signed the assurance agreement. Uh, the slide up here is just a map of where the subdivisions are located throughout the city. In April, the IRAB subcommittee began meeting again with a goal to develop a mechanism to protect the city and its taxpayers in future subdivisions. The subcommittee was made up of developers, home builders, consulting engineers, contractors, city staff, and then representatives from title companies, surety companies, and financial institutions. Several meetings were held between April and July, and I, I thank everyone involved for their participation and the new, numerous hours spent on this. In particular, I want to thank uh, two gentlemen in the audience tonight. One is Kurt Peppel. He's a civil engineer uh, on my team. He spent a lot of time on this. And also our outside counsel, Brett Loverin. He's with Caldwell, Sanford, Debert, and Gary. Uh, so thank Thank you to both of you. The product of the subcommittee is the subdivision construction agreement. The intent is that it will replace the current assurance agreement, and this will bring the construction of subdivisions and public improvements very similar. It is a combination of language from our current assurance agreement and the city's general conditions for public improvements. That's the document we follow uh, when we execute the capital plan. It does require performance security, and it does require a warranty security. State codified law 11.629 allows the city to accept a financial security in lieu of the completion of the public improvements. 
The requirement of, of these types of securities in subdivisions is very common in the region and are required in Rapid City, Sioux City, West Des Moines, Cedar Rapids, and Lincoln. With the new agreement, developers will have four options for constructing their subdivisions. Option one is to complete all of the public improvements, let the warranty period expire, and then plat. Under this option, the developer does not have to provide a performance or warranty security. However, the time period from when construction begins to when platting could occur could range from two to three years. Option two is to complete all the public improvements and then plat. Under this option, the developer does not have to provide a performance security, but would need to provide a warranty security. Option three is to begin construction and then plat at some point during the construction period. Under this option, the developer at platting would provide a performance security for the public improvements, not yet complete, and then a warranty security. An example, uh, if a developer was going to construct a, an eight-lot cul-de-sac and the public improvements were estimated to cost $100,000, under this scenario, the developer has completed all the improvements except the top lift of asphalt. The top lift is estimated to cost $15,000. So at platting, the developer would provide us a financial security for $15,000 and then proceed with platting. Option four is to plat prior to construction, and under this scenario, the developer would have to provide a performance security in amount of $100,000, um, and then he could proceed with platting. All right, um, very quickly, the agreement covers a lot of, a lot of pieces of this. Um, there's declarations that include the developer wishes to develop, the city wishes to prevent the use of public funds to complete the private development. The agreement must be executed prior to the approval of a plat or the issuance of a construction permit. And then also they have to declare how they're going to proceed with construction. Are they going to construct before platting or plat before construction? Section one talks about definitions. Uh, section two talks about the time period of construction, which is two years. Uh, it is, can be extended up to one additional year. Four talks about the performance security. Uh, it'll never be less than 10% of the improvements, and it'll have to be 100% of the engineer's estimate to, for the uncompleted public improvements at the time of platting. And the mechanisms that they can use are an escrow account, a bond, or an irrevocable letter of credit. Section 5 does talk about that we do allow performance security reductions. Section 6 talks about the warranty and acceptive acceptance policies. The utility acceptance will include all the utilities and will be warranted for two years. Final acceptance will be the curb and gutter and surfacing and we'll have a one-year warranty, and those warranties are the same as that we have today, so we're not changing any of the warranty times. Seven does talk about the warranty security. It'll be in the amount of 10% of the engineer's estimate to construct all the improvements, and once again, it'll be secured in favor of the city by an escrow account, a bond, or an irrevocable letter of credit. Section 8 talks about warranty inspections. Section 9 discusses the requirements of the engineer's estimate. Section 10 provides more details on street lighting. Section 11 through 21 were taken directly from our general conditions for public improvements. Talks about the duties of the inspector, the authority of the city engineer, coordination of documents, cooperation by developers, inspection of work, the materials to be used, the conformity with plans and specs, remedies for substandard work, acceptance limitations, revisions to the approved plans, developer and contractor employees, methods and equipment, the protection of valley gutters and fillets during construction, maintenance of traffic during construction, roadway maintenance responsibilities, 
transfer responsibility, failure to complete the required improvements, and then it outlines what it means if there's a breach of contract. To conclude, um, the subdivision construction agreement, just like the assurance agreement is today, will be signed by the developer and the mayor. This agreement has been approved by the Infrastructure Review Advisory Board. The agreement has been approved by the Planning Commission. The Home Builders Association of the Sioux Empire supports the adoption of this agreement. And finally, the agreement will prevent the use of public funds to complete private development. So once again, I'm going to thank you for your patience and time, and I'll try to answer your questions. Chad, great job. I know you put a lot of your heart and soul in this, and you've got a lot of your team involved in this, and a lot of the city team, and a lot of people around the community. So thank you for your diligence and trying to explain it to the council and to the uh, public. This is the first reading, so I'm going to turn it over to the council. Councilor Anderson, Jr. Okay, excuse myself. Oh. Councilor Anderson, Jr. is going to rec recuse himself from this one. Uh, Councilor Staggers. Chad, um, I guess I'm wondering still why you put so much time and effort in this whole thing. Now, I know at the beginning you said to protect the city in the future. Well, why do we have any obligation if a developer doesn't, you know, he has a subdivision, he builds some houses, he doesn't put the street in. Oh, we don't have an obligation at all to, to put the street in. Just let it sit there. And he'll eventually get the message that if he's going to sell any houses, he's going to have to do that. So, I mean, I don't see, I don't, well, if I could have Chad and well, then. I can give you a perfect example. Um, street I used to live on was a uh, private drive or uh, it was developed and platted it out and everything like that. For two years we sat with the, with the last layer of, uh, of uh, mm -hmm. asphalt to go on there. We were hoping and praying that he would do that, mm -hmm. okay? He could have walked away from that very easily. And then what would we have done? This would have prevented him by having, it, having that bond with the city down there. We could have then gone to the city and said he didn't perform on his contract, and they would have been able to say, we've got the 10% down here. We can now put that top, the final layer of asphalt down on there for you. We've got the money to do that, and we're not stuck as a city to do that. Chad, well, would you we, take uh, Councilor Stegers back? Correct? Would you take Councilor Stegers back to the uh, slide with the $3.6 million liability along with the uh, developers that uh, are no longer in business or can't be found? See, I'm contending we don't have any liability. That's, that's what I'm contending. Well, first of all, I would say that um, when a home buyer or a, a home buyer buys a home or a lot in a subdivision, um, their expectation is that the public improvements will be completed. Mm -hmm. I agree, but we don't have any liability. It's their, it's, it's their issue with the, the contractor, yes. It is, but it's public right of way, and which is, which is the responsibility of the city well it becomes our property once it's once been it's, completed if once it's just it's, sitting there once it's dedicated to the public for the use as right-of-way um, then it becomes public right-of-way you 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 said something to the effect that um, they won't sell any lots well there's there's subdivisions out there that are 90 percent sold and there is no top lift of asphalt, and there's no, there's nobody to put that top lift on except the city of Sioux Falls. Well, I, I guess I would say that the easiest way to get around that is simply do not take the, assume the right of way or any of that until it's completed. Well, let me back up a second. Mm -hmm. um, when we looked at this issue, there's there's two ways to, there's two pieces of this. There's the there was the A, which was the 30 subdivisions that were out of compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, the 30 subdivisions who committed to completing improvements um, and then breached a contract with the city. So we've dealt, I think, fairly well with mm -hmm. the 30 when we're down to an 11. Um, 
That's great. And then the next piece of this is to um, how do we not be in this situation in the future? Um, I can tell you there's a community just south of us that's just that spent $300,000 of their sales tax revenue to finish developments. And I would maybe refer to Dave on um, potentially the liability of the city. But um, in my opinion, um, those roads are going to have to be completed. I agree. It's just a matter of when and who's going to do it. And, you know, I think we should make sure that we don't get stuck with it ever. He's doing And that's what we're doing. Well, if, what's if going it, on here is that we're coming up with this rather elaborate scheme, which is making things, I think, a lot more difficult, when it's much easier just to say, look, we're not going to assume any liability for this until we actually get the street deeded to us, the right-of-way deeded to us, and that's, that's it. So if you build all these houses and you don't complete the street, well, hey, we're not, we don't have any liability. You're going to have to take care of that issue. And if you can't take care of it, you'll eventually probably end up selling it and somebody else will have to do it. But we can get, a, get away from all of this, uh, from what's been presented tonight. This is just really getting to be really very complicated. When it, well, there's no way easier. that the developer, um, the platting process is what triggers this. Once that right of way is dedicated to the city of Sioux Falls, um, that just the road, sure the, don't do the road, and the improvements have to be complete. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is, mm -hmm. they should not be allowed to dedicate the right of way until the improvements are complete. That's right, and that would solve the problem. It potentially would, but I, um, I don't think that's the solution here. Um, I've think, spent countless hours with the development community, working on um, what's a solution so that everybody uh, can win in this. Yeah, I just, Councilor again, fi finally, let me good just job. mention, I just think. No, Councilor Sayers, good job. Thank you. This simply should make this as simple as possible without making it complicated. Because, well, uh, the presentation you gave tonight was only just partial. I mean, you were reading off all those other areas of the ordinance, and I'm just sitting here thinking, we don't need all of this at all. Actually, Councilor Stegers, thank you. Councilor I Anders. guess I do disagree here. I guess the bottom line is, is that you've got people out there that are putting their neck out to develop, and they are, counting on the fact that they're going to be able to get the funding that they need, counting on the fact they're going to be able to sell the lots. The economy takes a hit. You know, they've built a few lots out there. They have put in a city street. The perception it is a city street. And now the Yahoo takes off and leaves everybody hanging with it. These guys are hanging at the banks on, on the landowners that are doing it. There was a good faith contract that was met with them. There was a good faith um, agreement made with the city when it comes to this. Now the bottom line is, whether we like it or not, there is, there is a point in time in today's society where there's a lot of legalese and there's a lot of uh, accusations out there and everybody is suing everybody because they can. The bottom line is this ordinance in my, or this thing protects the citizens of Sioux Falls against that. It's putting, making the developers commit to the project by a letter of credit or whatever it is that they have to get from their bank. It's making them to be good business people. And I think uh, we are a growing city. We're not tombstone out here anymore that's totally undeveloped. And we've got a responsibility to continue to assure that this community is going to continue to develop in a realistic uh, way. And you're right. Uh, Councillor Steggers, you know, it's a lot of BS, quite honestly. Yeah. But unfortunately, that's the way it is today. And I would hope that we would support this and pass it. Good job. Well done. Thank Council, you. would anybody want to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, December 4th at 7 p.m. for item three? So move, Entman. And uh, seconded, uh, Rolfing. Thank you. There's been a motion to uh, set this date of hearing and seconded by Councillor Rolfing. Uh, yes, Councillor Jameson. I know it's late, but. Uh, that's just the way it goes, I guess. Chad, a few questions, if I could. The, Certainly. Uh, um, tell me how you uh, how you feel this will. Uh, do you feel this will separate large developers from the would-be small developers? Do you think this prohibits or prevents uh, guys who just want to start up and try to do something like this from ever doing it? Is there a financial burden that's too great? I think a lot of. I mean. When they have to provide us a financial security, it's going to depend on, you know, 
the, their financial uh, situation, their credit rating, how much money they have in the bank. Um, I do think that if there is, I don't think it's going to limit uh, somebody from getting into the business, but if they're not financially sound, um, you know, the, the cost for them to get the security could be higher uh, than somebody in a different or a better financial position. Okay, do you see it uh, promoting growth or promoting development? I do. In what way? Um, I guess my opinion or the opinion of the group is that um, the people that maybe are in the development business that um, potentially shouldn't be. And I think it's going to um, bring the playing field to an even level. Um, I think that um, the one thing that we have to be with all the developments is consistent. and. Um, I don't think things have been done as consistent as they needed to be in the past, and I think this will bring everybody to the same playing field. Okay, and then in the past, uh, how much has the city spent on finishing out developments in the city of Sioux Falls? I am aware of, um, in my time here, which is a little over six years, I'm aware of one instance um, where we probably completed improvements uh, to the tune of $150,000 um, okay, on a particular street. And, but I can't say there hasn't been more prior to me. Okay, then one last question if I could. The, uh, the, the idea is uh, certainly the standards for the developer have been dramatically changed for them to perform on a level that is higher and improved. and in all fairness, uh, probably needed to be done in some ways. Um, the developer's got obligations to things that he's got to do, but what has the city done? Is there any change that the city now... So when you're making this agreement, the, the developer has all these increased responsibilities. Has the city... has any? Do they have any increased responsibilities in the agreement? I mean, if the city says they're not going to... we're going to build and... Ex, we're going to expand uh, Western Avenue or something. The economy hits and they can't afford to develop that road any further because the CIP only goes so far and decisions are made and the money is allocated for different places. The city says we can't do it. The developers out there potentially developing lots, betting on the come for that street to be put in, but the city decides not to. Is there any obligations? Well, first of all, I don't I don't think we're going to get to this stage um, with the subdivision construction process unless our infrastructure is there. Um, they're not going to be, if they don't have water. Oh, you're saying, all right, if there's not sewer in the area, they're not going to be out there platting land. No, and, and so I think we're. That's true. There has to be sewer there. There has to be water available. Now, whether that's brought from another private subdivision or, or it's brought to us, I mean, what we're seeing a lot is. Um, there will always be, I mean, they'll have access off a to a subdivision off a, maybe even a collector street of some sort. And we come back um, shortly after the development's begun and maybe provide that secondary access. So I think that, you know, we're not going to be at this position to plat, and they're not going to start turning dirt unless the, the utilities are there. Because they're not, they, I mean, they have to have the utilities there to proceed. That, that's very good. Yeah, you're right. I, I, okay, so what about, though, any, any other obligations from the city? Or is this all developer changing? Anything else on the city's side? I, I mean, the only, the only change in here um, is the financial security. I mean, all of the other, um, like I mentioned, a lot of the other requirements are coming right out of our general conditions. It's how we construct our capital program. So a lot of the, uh, the different items in here, whether it's the warranty or the testing procedures or the quality control is already there. Oh. So the, the one thing, and I, and I do think the thing we're going to see is, I think you'll see a lot of, I don't see, you, you won't see anybody come in and uh, plat the right of way and build all the work um, and then let it sit 
and let the warranty period expire before they sell lots. They're just not going to do that. So what I think you're going to see a lot of people is they're going to come in, give us a construction plan, go out on their private property, do all the grading, install the utilities, probably put the curb and gutter in, the bottom left of asphalt. Then, when they want to start selling lots, that's when they'll come in and plat. And my, in my example, um, if it's $15,000 to do the top lift, um, they'll provide a financial security. Now, what I've heard is that to get a bond, it's about 2 to 4%. Um, did you say something greater? I was guessing. Okay. Well, that's, and I think in a lot varies on the financial stability of the developer. But let's just say that bond will cost this guy um, 3%. It's uh, $300 or $400 split upon those eight lots. So um, it's a relatively small amount of money um, that gives us the financial security that the improvements will be complete. So really the, 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 the big change here is the financial security. It's good. Well, very good dialogue. Thank you very much. Uh, there has been a uh, motion to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, December 4th. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can I ask one quick question? Uh, did this go through a uh, council committee? Yes. Public service, oh, I, I, I guess. Oh, I should have said that, yeah. It was recommended to come to the full council by the Public Services Committee. Okay. Good Thank job. You. Thank you. A roll call vote, please. Okay. Council members Aguilar? Yes. Entman? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. That is passed six to zero. 33. All right, 33 is first reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, revising, amending, restating, codifying, and compiling certain existing general ordinances of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, providing for the repeal of certain ordinances not included therein, providing a penalty for the violation thereof, and providing for the manner of amending the code. Hi. Good evening, Karen Leonard, Deputy City Attorney. Excuse me. Um, this ordinance can be referred to as the recodification ordinance. Our city charter requires the, the code of ordinances to be updated every 20 years. The last time this was done was in 1972 and 1992, respectively. So we're upon that due date in 2012. And recodification means that this is a process of compiling and arranging the laws into an orderly code. We began this process in the summer of 2011, so we've been working on this for the last year and a half. Um, and American Legal, our publishing company, has been very involved in the process. They first performed a technical review wherein they gave us recommendations of how to better organize the code. Um, they also performed a legal review and gave us recommendations where they thought changes could be made. And uh, all of the city departments did a comprehensive review of their areas of the law that applied to them. And I did want to note that American Legal told me that the city of Sioux Falls did a wonderful job in doing this process. They thought that it was a very thorough review that we have a lot of uh, um, commendable people that are detail oriented and that they thought the process was very smooth. So I wanted to thank all the department heads for their involvement in this process to make this work so well. Um, I wanted to go through with you tonight, if you adopt this ordinance, what uh, type of changes are going to occur. The code is currently named um, the revised ordinances of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and it is now being changed to code of ordinances of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, American Legal made a recommendation to us to reorganize the code. Currently, uh, we use a chapter system um, organized alphabetically. Uh, American Legal re uh, recommended that the code be grouped into titles with a new numbering system. The appendixes A through E will no longer be used, um, and they have been now uh, put back into chapters. And the topics are now grouped by subject matter. And so our hope is, is that the code will become more user friendly to the citizens of Sioux Falls. Uh, there were no revisions made to the charter. I do want to point that out, that uh, that is not part of this review. Uh, the revisions that were made uh, primarily related to archaic language being removed 
or if um, uh, it referenced the Department of Finance and it was really the city licensing specialist that did that work, we updated it to whose job responsibilities those were. We did add an index uh, for fees and that will be, our hopes is to put that out online to make that uh, user friendly to the consumer. And um, one last thing I would note is the penalty has not been changed uh, for a code violation since 1992. So our recommendation is that uh, state law does allow us to increase the maximum ordin ordinance penalty from 30 days in jail and a $200 fine or both to 30 days in jail with a $500 fine or both. Um, and uh, this was brought before, the entire process was brought before the Public Services Committee several times and they have recommended their approval to bring this forth to the City Council tonight. Any questions? Council, would anybody want to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, December 4th at 7 p.m.? So moved, Rolfing. Second. Councilor Rolfing has made that motion, seconded by Councilor Anderson, Jr. A roll call vote, please. Council members Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Entman? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0, item 34. <coughs> this is first reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, providing supplemental appropriations to fund retro pay wages and health insurance premiums for transit. This request would provide a $210,000 supplemental appropriation. The fund source is the transit fund unobligated fund balance. In April of this year, excuse me, in August of this year, the city council received a memo from the city attorney's office indicating that a transit labor agreement had been reached and that that labor agreement was retroactive back to April 1st of 2011. And that indication was that there would be some impact on the current budget and that we would monitor the budget throughout the rest of this year to determine what type of an appropriation a supplement would be required. So now we're bringing this forward. The $210,000 is based on the city finance office's um, analysis and we are requesting approval of that. And this is first reading tonight. Councilor Sangers. Yeah, Mike, did you say something about April 2011? Uh, yeah, it, the, the agreement was retroactive to April 1st of 2011. On our red notes that we have here, it says, and provides retroactive pay for 2012. Um, is that just a mistake? It or? might have been. Be okay. I'll, I can forge you the August 3rd memo once again that kind of outlines uh, okay. the summary of the, the labor agreement. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Councilor Rolfing, would you like to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, December 4th at 7 p.m. for item 34? You bet I would. Second, Karski. Thank you. Uh, councilors, I appreciate that. Uh, roll call vote, please. Council members Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Entman? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Thank you. That is passed 7 to 0, item 35. 35 is first reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the revised ordinances of the city to further define when an animal can be declared vicious and to provide certain requirements after an animal bite incident. Keith Halstein, Assistant City Attorney. I also have uh, Sergeant Cowell with the Police Department here. Uh, this ordinance makes basically five changes to our present ordinance on vicious animals. The first change uh, sets the standard for when an animal can be declared vicious regardless of where that, that uh, animal attack or bite occurs, whether it be private or public property. The second change uh, provides uh, a lengthier time, uh, changing it from five to 15 days in which a person has to bring their animal into compliance if it's been declared vicious. Uh, that period was lengthened to uh, make it the same amount of time that a person would also have to appeal that decision under administrative appeal process that we have in place now. Uh, the third change uh, is to allow animal control, the police department to impound an animal that is not in compliance after it's been declared vicious, uh, the appeal time is run and, and they have met certain requirements. If they're no longer in <coughs> compliance under the present ordinance, we can only do it if the animal's at large. Uh, for instance, what, we, what this would allow us to do is if uh, one of the things that an animal 
owners are required to do is to get a, a certain amount of insurance once their animals have been declared uh, vicious. Uh, right now, if that policy lapses, we don't really have a, a basis to go in and impound that animal. Uh, this would provide us the opportunity to do that. Uh, the last two changes then uh, basically would impose upon uh, the animal owner some duties. Uh, first of all, in section 7-3.1 as proposed, it would provide a responsibility on the animal owner to notify police or animal control once there's been an attack or a bite incident. And un under subsection uh, 7 point or 7-3.2 would require the animal owner to exchange name and address information and provide any assistance to the victim of that attack or injury if, if they need that. I'm available for any questions. Council, if there are no questions, uh, would anybody want to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, December 4th at 7 p.m.? So move, Carson. Second, Anderson. Councilor Karski has made that motion, seconded by Councilor Anderson, Jr. A roll call vote, please. Council members Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Entman? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0, item 36. A resolution approving a fraud control policy for the city. Rich Oaksel from Internal Audit. Um, this has, policy's been in the works for over a year. Um, uh, d we discussed it with the Audit Committee last year and then it was uh, forwarded on to Fiscal. Um, I'm the, the drafter of the policy and uh, we used examples from uh, many other organizations to come up with the policy. Uh, many organizations, whether private or government or not-for-profit, have uh, similar policies. Um, once I had drafted a, uh, uh, a policy, uh, we worked with the city attorney and the director of human resources to fine tune it and we came up with a policy that we could all live with. And uh, fiscal committee, uh, we discussed it with them and they uh, passed it on to the full council. And if there's any questions, I'd be uh, happy to answer those. Council? Move to approve the resolution, Entman. Second, Karski. There's been a motion to approve this resolution, seconded by uh, Councillor Karski. If there's no discussion on roll call vote, please. Council members Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Entman? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0, item 37. A resolution amending the 2012 to 2016 capital program. This resolution amends the Arterial Street Improvements Project in the 2012 to 2016 capital program. It increases the amount of the Arterial Street platting fees by $550,000 and the water distribution platting fee by $350,000 for 2012. We talked Arterial Street platting fees in item 27. Now we'll talk about a little bit about the, the water distribution system platting fee. One of the revenues used to expand the water distribution system is this platting fee. Uh, the, the water distribution system is defined as water main that is 16 inches and larger and is typically installed during the construction of arterial streets. During the first three years of, of its existence, we collected an average of $155,000 per year. To date, this year, we have collected approximately $518,000. The appropriated amount in the 2012 capital program is $184,000. These funds will be used for the design and construction of the transmission mains in our arterial streets. Chad, thank you again. Move for approval, Anderson. Second, Entman. Councilor Anderson Jr. has made a motion to approve this resolution, seconded by Councilor Entman. If there's no discussion on roll call vote, please. Council members Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Entman? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Council, any uh, new business? Oh, Councilor Entman? Just one thing, Mr. Mayor. I just want to remind the other council members that concerning the vault of the discussion earlier, if you do have any questions that you would like to be addressed at the next hearing, please forward those on to us, to myself or to Michelle, and we'll put those together and get them on to the parties involved. Great job, uh, Councilor. Appreciate it. Well, very good. Uh, council, uh, would anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? So moved, Aguilar.
Second, Garski. It's been a motion to adjourn. It has been seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Well, very good. Council, it's almost 10 o'clock. What a productive night for this city and for this council. Really appreciate your work. Sioux Falls, happy, happy holidays. Enjoy your family. Enjoy your friends. Stay safe. Make it a great night, Sioux Falls. This meeting is adjourned.